have already been secured and of course we have a third one up for grabs this weekend here it's the clash royale league monthly finals i'm rich slayton joined by two-time regional clash royale league champion joshua ac sharon and juicy j your world cyber games champion to bring you a great weekend of clash royale league where we have eight competitors battling out not only for a golden ticket but for points in our leaderboards to go towards that world finals berth josh juicy excited for both of you guys here josh what are you most excited about today what am I most excited about today? Well, I mean, I think it just has to be, I, I wanna see history made. I, I, don't, I don't care about anything else. I can tune everything else out. I wanna see Muhammad Light get the back to back to back. The back to back to back, juicy. We have a lot of, we have a few world champions in here with Muhammad and Mugi. Of course, we have a lot of upstarts. Is there anyone outside of Muhammad Light you're looking at today? Honestly, the biggest one I'm looking at today is Audriel. I think that um, he's got that same coach Muhammad Light has behind him, and I think he's been practicing a lot. He's a serial or potential serial world finalist last year, and um, yeah, I'm excited to see if maybe he could prevent the triple back to back to back and take the golden ticket today. And of course, we have two days of Clash Royale League today, but Josh, it all started for this month a couple weeks ago with our Path of Legends. That's right, you finish a or in the top 1,000 on the leaderboards. You get invited to participate, to compete for one of these golden tickets. Last week, we moved from the top 1,000 players all the way up to the top eight players. That's where we're at right now. If you were to win everything this weekend, you are rewarded with a golden ticket. Is that the only way? No, because uh, Muhammad Light already has a golden ticket. If you finish second and he finishes first, you still walk away with that golden tick ticket. All these players are competing for their chance to compete in the world finals. Same thing as always for the last couple of years, it's gonna be the dual format, eight players, double elimination. It's gonna be best of threes. If you use a card, if you use a hog in game number one, you can't use it in games two or three. Rich, let's take a look at the leaderboard and see who's in the lead. Well, we have, of course, two names in gold who've already secured their world oh. finals berth by winning those monthly finals. Mohamed Light and Pandora, both with golden tickets. Of course, Mohamed Light winning our second monthly final. Pandora, as our second place player, got the left to the side golden ticket. Very important thing to note, though, the top seven of our overall ranked leaderboards will be going to world finals at the end of the year. And you can see right now that this only includes six of those places right outside of this list. You have a, a very important player who's appearing this weekend, our former world champion in Moogie. So the leaderboard very tight, lots of room to play. And here we go into what I call the chase portion of our leaderboard. Surgical Goblin, another former world champion in the mix, trying to make his way up to the top seven. All 16 of these players are very much in the hunt. And in fact, everyone's still in the hunt because not only are there lots of points left to go, there are, of course, not including this weekend, going to be four more golden tickets out there. So of course, everybody watching right now has their opportunities. But the big question, Juicy J, the question that has to be on everyone's mind is, what is the opportunity worth when a guy like Mohammed Light is out there? Can anybody stop him? Let's take a look at some of what he's done throughout his career and of course throughout this year. Juicy, is anybody going to put a stop to the path of Mr. Clash Royale? Yeah, I was talking about something similar uh, something similar about this question with Boss CR this uh, this week at the Supercell Creator Camp. But he asked me, who do you think is going to win this month's the finals? I was like, of course, it's going to be Muhammad Light. But he was like, oh, well, I guess I should have asked, who do you think is going to win the golden ticket? 
And that's the point we are with Muhammad Light. We're to the point where most people are just not even thinking about who's going to win anymore because they know that Mo's going to win. They're more thinking about, okay, who's going to get second place to get the golden tickets. And I don't know if we've ever experienced something like that in Clash Royale. He's just so dominant and it's just crazy the things that he's accomplished. I mean, he's won, I think, every single thing he's been in so far in 2023. And right now, of course, uh, we have two players who've gone back-to-back -back in monthly finals. We have Mohamed Light and, of course, Lucas, the only person to do it without a coach. And then, Josh, the, we have the chance right now this weekend for Mohamed Light to go three-peat. What do you give the percentage chances looking at this bracket for Mo to run through all of this once more and do the three-peat? I, I mean, you, you got to start off high. You got to say better than a one out of eight chance for sure. I, I'm i taking a look at the bracket and there's a lot of talent. I, okay, so I was, you know, doing a little bit of research. Lord Seb is the lowest on the leaderboards at 43rd overall, but all these players are just in the hunt. They're consistently doing well every single month. So, I mean, there there's just a lot of talent there. I, I'd still say it's probably 50-50, which is just crazy to say. It's crazy to say. Taking a look at this bracket, Lord Seb came out of a very important group. More on that one later. Played spoiler, can he do it again today? On the other side, though, Mohamed Light, no matter who he no matter who he faces, he's facing a murderer in either Mugi or Adriel if he does get past Lord Seb. And we know he often loses that first round matchup. Pedro, the young rookie, possible rookie of the year, up against Hugo in our third match of the day. And then Faust and Sosa on the other end. We'll see who can battle their way through to the top of everything. And speaking of battle their way through, we have to do some predictions, boys. What do you have in store? It looks like we're all in agreement on that first match, but some differences in match two and match four. Josh, I'll go with you first. We have myself and Juicy both picking Adriel. You're picking the former world champion. I, I think I have to. Uh, Moogie's gameplay, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. His, his gameplay is just so beautiful. It, it's clear. I A lot of these players, we talk on and on about their talent with a micro. Oh, look at this interaction. Only he could have done that. But Moogie's gameplay, there's a lot of macro involved with that as well. He knows what to do in every situation. His Rascal's Graveyard play, so methodical. He knows how to get the damage at the end of the game. So I, I just think Moogie has to be the favorite in that match. And down to our match number four. The other disagreement here is we all pick Pedro in match three. Juicy J, you're going with Faust. The the at this point, even though it seems strange to say, the veteran over the upstart in Sosa. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit before the broadcast, but you know, a lot of players talk about Sosa and his skill level, and I 100% agree. But I just haven't seen that consistency, and I haven't seen him perform at the highest level. Maybe it's nerves. Maybe it's not. Faust, on the other hand, he's just been really consistent lately. He seems like he's always making it to these monthly finals or at least into the group stage. And he's just done quite a fantastic job of proving his worth so far. Well, speaking of proving their worth, we have our first match coming up. And this is a big one because we already know the worth of Mohamed Light. He's a world champion. He's the Pharaoh. He's Mr. Clash Royale. The big question, though, is can his teammate, Lord Seb Sebastian, put the hurt to him. And some context here for everyone, folks, Lord Seb came out of the group stage where he was in the same group as Surgical Goblin and the much-loved Logbait player Riley and served as spoiler, prevented both those guys from making it here today. And the question I'm going to put to you, Josh, is is there any chance that Lord Seb continues playing that spoiler role here against Mo in our first matchup? You know, there's always going to be a chance. It's Clash Royale. That's the beauty of the game. You know, you can you you can do a lot of outside things to affect how the set actually gets played. So yes, you can outplay him in terms of deck matchup, and you know, you you can practice two or three different decks on the side without telling anybody. So you you can have a surprise factor as well. But at the end of the day, you know, Muhammad Light's working on the same thing. He's always working on that next deck. He's the one who popularized uh, the giant skeleton hog, I believe, last year or earlier this season. He, he just, he's always innovating. And when you're the best in the game and you're innovating, good things happen. And uh, man, just a little, little note here for the production booth. Four of the eight players in today's monthly final are from Shot Kalalis. Juicy, what are they doing over there with all this high level stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's a great team, and they're signing the best players. I mean, I don't know what they're doing. They must give some sort of uh, incentive, but I'll let you guys go. Uh, have fun in this match.
Here we go, Lord Sebastian, bottom of your screen. Mohammed Light needs no introduction, even though we often give him one at the top. And Josh, looking at Lord Sebastian, over two thirds of his games in CRL so far for this season were either Royal Giant, Hog Rider, or Drill. So he's been very focused on maybe three decks. Uh, it seems like that might be a bit narrow in going up against a guy like Muhammad Light with Jebba's helping him make those deck picks. Yeah, and I mean, if you're going to start off with using one of those two decks, that just seems pretty risky. And right there, I believe that was the second uh, activation of that uh, Skeleton King. So that's really impressive for Lord Seb. He's going to get a lot of damage in this. RG is going to get the tower down to 1436. Big shots early on from Lord Sebastian as he would love to take this win off of Mohammed Light. Anyone who can get a win off of Mo is certainly a feather in their cap. You even see some content creators, if they beat him once on ladder, make a whole video about it. So most certainly it's something that players are hoping to do. The question is, can you beat him twice? And can you stop him from getting all the way to a final? Lord Sebastian now sets up Tombstone as we pass the midway point of regulation. Lead by about 1,200 HP for the young player. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how this Golden Knight gets used throughout this game. Is it going to be able to get the value it needs to get? Look at all those dashes right there on top of all the zappies. It's going to take most of them out. We see it take one of them out and then almost the second one. But it's just so hard. I mean, he took so much damage at the beginning of the game. It's such a fantastic start for Lloyd Sepp. And Muhammad Light has to find some way through. But with Zappies, Fisherman, Tombstone, how difficult is that going to be for the Prince of Egypt? Yeah, it really just depends. How is Lord Seb going to utilize his uh, Zappies and his Fishermen as well? He doesn't want to allow everything to get Tornado together. And it's so hard to stop that because you're going in the same lane. So you, you know what you need to do and your opponent knows that same thing. Right there, it feels kind of like a wasted NATO a little bit. But it's going to be able to clean everything up. So excuse me, I was wrong. That was the correct NATO. 15 seconds left, and Lord Seb keeping the pressure on in these bridge fights. Phoenix will go down. Decently healthy Fisherman behind the Royal Giant. Should be some good stuff here for the Golden Knight trying to clean up in the backfield, but RG will get one shot here. A very important shot. That right-hand tower now down to under 1,000 HP. Going to be able to take out the Mother Witch just in time. Lord Seb does have plenty of elixir, so he's going to be able to clean that up. Lightning going to come down as well, but... This defense is too strong, 1,000 HP separating the two players. And with 142 left, E-Giant Lightning going against Zappi's Tombstone, it's gonna be tough for Muhammad Light to break through. And Fireball, just to clean off the two Elixir Bomber, get some more damage here. And as my co-caster saying, very difficult to break through at this stage. A lot of RG run by Lord Seb, but you know, the one of the hard parts about predicting there against him is how many variations of RG he runs. Sometimes with Tombstone, sometimes no building, sometimes with Monk or with Skeleton King, sometimes no champion. So kind of been all over the place. And of course, as we know, those minor variations can create big differences in these matchups. Final minute, triple elixir. Is there a route to victory for Muhammad Light here, Josh? I don't know. A, a, a huge route that could have opened up would have been that bomber at the bridge, but Lord Seb's bar barrel, it, it was able to take out one of the troops, and then it was able to clean up the bomber as well. So that was just so massive for him. That's another 30 seconds just taken off of the clock just because of that one interaction. So that is just massive for him. Zappy's up top. He doesn't want to allow the NATO, or the NATO giant or uh, the NATO golden knight to get to the tower, and that is clean defense again. This is exactly what he's looking for. This is brilliant. Is there a lightning? Not enough elixir for it. And so while Muhammad Light would have loved to take advantage of that fisherman pulling the electro giant in, just can't quite do it. Golden Knight trying to escape. Can the Golden Knight get on tower here? Lightning in. Golden Knight, is there a dash? There is no dash available. GG, well played. Game number one for Lord Seb here and Muhammad Light gives him the respect, the good game, as they reset here for game number two.
I mean, are you kidding me? That is a fantastic bar barrel. Once again, these bar barrels saved his tower over and over again. 10 seconds left. He knows that the Golden Knight wants to get the dash on the top of the tower, so he plays the high bar barrel, so it has to dash backwards. That is fantastic, just presence of mind to not allow the Golden Knight onto the tower. Let's see what Lord Seb goes with. Last time he played, opened up with that first deck, he went to Minor MK Prince for his game number two. We'll see if he repeats that same sequence again here against Mohammed Light. And most certainly not. Was that a look of surprise out of Mo Light there, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be honest. I was, I was trying to figure out what the uh, what the matchup was going to be, so <laughs> I, I didn't get to see. Little eyebrow raise here, and a lot of so, more swarm pressure here from Muhammad Light. I've uh, I've seen this mortar deck used quite a bit. This is actually one of my favorite decks overall. I just think it's so strong, and you just overwhelm. You have so many different answers that you really aren't expecting in a lot of mortar decks so it can get really awkward when you're cleaning up on defense and you might have missed it there folks but a tiny one little skeleton you see lord sheb shake his head shake his head there one skeleton got through tanked for by the miner and that's where you get that giant chunk of damage on the left hand side as we get about halfway through our opening stanza it's kind of the same story as our first match except for completely reverse Mohammed light out to a significant early lead yeah and Lord Seb it, it, this has to be balloon right just using monk balloon yeah I mean it it's so interesting to see balloon without giant skeleton right now um but not surprised to see minor here although of course Lord Seb has favored the minor MK Prince wall breakers deck interesting to see him kind of make this make this adjustment but that's what you have to do at a stage like this in a match like this one yeah, and right here, the giant skeleton variation, he, he would have been able to protect his balloon, use the giant skeleton in front, and yes, you can still do with that with the monk, and you would think it would work better just because, you know, you have the archers and you have the flying machine, so all of those are going to get reflected back from the monk, but I don't know, it, it's just, it's not a lot of HP overall, so I, I just don't know if he's going to be able to break through. Here goes the minor loon play. Fly Machine does go to the Miner, not the Balloon, but the Late Mortar to pull back up high from Muhammad Light will clean that up nicely. And this is going to be a tall order for Sebastian to try to find any purchase as we go into double and triple elixir. One of the interactions I really love that Muhammad Light can pull off every single time if he wants to is he places the cannon cart high in order for the monk to force an activation, then the monk's reflection will actually allow the cannon cart to activate as a building, and it's just gonna be one more thing that pulls the balloon. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he tries that interaction over and over as the game goes on. Little creativity now out of Lord Seb going with a balloon from the back, and that miner picked up immediately. You see the shake of the head there from Sebastian, not happy with the way that one went, and. You can see just things went from bad to worse, it seems. Trying different things, being creative. But we've all been here before. There's some times when you're caught between a rock, a hard place, and an even harder place. <laughs> yeah, and right here, he just could not do anything. Muhammad Light's defense was always solid, and I think it really comes down to the monk. It, it never got the opportunity to get the reflection that he needed. I think it comes down to he gave up too much early damage and he wasn't able to build that one really good push. So here we go, game number three on its way between these two players. Lord Seb going minor monk balloon, hoggy Q, which he favors, is still available. Drill is also available as the two primary decks he plays. NATO in play for him as well. Would not be surprised to see either Drill versus Hog or Hog versus Hog here in game three. Let's see what these guys go to. And Ice Spirit does lean Hog Rider, especially with that Earthquake. So it looks like you are correct on Muhammad Light side, cycling early using the Ice Spirit, now the Musketeer, as well as the Earthquake. So at the very least, it's going to be very quick cycle. And Lord Seb, on the other hand, with RG out of play, there's there's still a few options that could and I was thinking EJ wow. Golem. He has not <laughs> Golem played Golem at all. 
Golem is not even on any of the decks that he has played throughout this CRL season. So this is a fascinating pick from Lord Seb here. And uh, it's going to be an interesting battle for him in this one, but certainly trying to be unpredictable against Mohammed Light with his deck in game two and this one again in game three. And I really like this play by Lord Seb. Use something that you've never used before. Use the Golem. That's going to be one of those decks that just either gets a good matchup or it gets a bad matchup. And if you get a bad matchup at the end of the day, you know, you, you did your best. You got it to game three. You got it, you know, you got it to the end of a set. But I love Golem used by Lord Seb here. Electro Dragon protected for the moment by the Golden Knight. And now the Mega Minion out and a great Ice Spirit. It does wander just a little bit over. You see Mo mutter there a little bit. I think he was hoping for that Ice Spirit to protect the Musketeer a little bit longer from the Electro Dragon. Doesn't do it. Opposite push and then now boom, King Tower activation. So here we go. First two minutes away, Josh. It's the Hog EQ Monk against this Golem E-Drag deck. Thoughts on the matchup? Yeah, so Muhammad Light only has a 500 HP lead, which is obviously something you need to look at, especially paired with it just being a bomb tower. It's not going to be the Inferno Tower. It's not going to be the Cannon, which also can be very effective in these kind of matchups. So I, right now, Lord Seb, I, I don't know if I would say he's in the better spot. I don't know. I might say that. I might say that Lord Seb is in the better spot, but we know how talented Muhammad Light is against Golem. It, it, I, I'm pretty sure it was like last year in the World Finals where he just had the most magnificent uh, defense ever. It could have been two years ago. So uh, Golem against Muhammad Light, I like the idea, but it's still at the end of the day, it's Muhammad Light. And we did just see the really brilliant Musketeer play with the log on the right hand side. We'll see how impactful that is. And as the hog goes to the other lane, Mo doing a really good job here in double of putting pressure plays and getting good damage. Yeah, that's exactly what you're supposed to do, but Lord Seb doing the exact same thing himself, overloading everything. We're gonna see the Golem, the E-Drag, the Mega Minion. This is exactly what you need to do, just overwhelm. And he even lets the Musketeer go lock onto the tower, so that way it's more pressure on the right lane with the Bomber. And Monk, the knockback, plus the ability, doing some good work, but Still, the pressure continues to mount, and you see even Elixir in the hole, but E-Drag plus Golem on the board requires a response, and this E-Drag will do more damage on the left-hand side. But keep in mind, folks, only 90 seconds left. There is a pretty significant lead for Muhammad Light, and that King Tower activation will play a role as we go into these final, because Lord Seb does have ground to make up. Hog pressure on the left side for Muhammad Light. Goblin Cage will come down, going to be able to clean up the Hog nicely. And here it is. This is, we're finally getting to the pushes. Lightning coming down on top of the Bomb Tower. Mega Minion plus E-Drag are going to help. But yes, the Golem will be able to reach the tower. Not going to be able to get a swing though. Is NATO available here for the Hog Rider? It should. Lord Seb does get it down correctly. 12.33 on the right hand side. Keep in mind right now with 51 seconds left. Mohammed Light does have the lead, 1426. Opposite lane pressure trying to extend that lead, but right now the play of the, wow, and it does get the stop there. The play of the Goblin Cage has been very important here. A nice monk reflection deep in enemy territory, 1098 hog in. Josh, this is going to be a nail biter. Yes, and right there, that was a phenomenal musketeer at the uh, on the side from Muhammad Light. That those are the game-winning plays you need to see. Musketeer going to be able to clean up the hog, but not or going to be able to clean up. I believe it was the Golden Knight, and right here it's going to be Lightning versus Earthquake. And NATO back, and you need to do that. You can't let the uh, monk activate on top of the tower. And this Goblin Cage plus the Mighty Miner. Is there time for one more Lightning or NATO? There is not! Oh Mohammed Light gets it done. And Lord Seb cannot believe it. 152 HP away from the massive upset. And for Mohammed Light, it's just another day in the office. <laughs> what a battle right there. Mohammed Light wins the game with the high musketeer ice spirit to protect his other musketeer right there. And I mean, every interaction needed to be perfect. He even activated the King Tower late in the game. I, I, that was great from Muhammad Light, but also just great from Lord Seb. I, I loved his deck choice in game number three, gave himself an opportunity, and I liked how he played it as well. And I don't know if Replay grabbed it, but hopefully they did.
did. There was that play midway through the game where Mohamed Light had the Musketeer on the right-hand side. There was a Bomber in reply and just a perfectly timed log with the Musketeer to just get that out of the way and get a little bit of damage on the right-hand side. And you talk about a little bit of damage, this is a game that was won by 152 HP. So making those choices, knowing when to make those choices, such a key feature and why he's been so dominant. And man, Lord Seb, again, I, I, the creativity in this matchup from him from game number two, and I believe uh, we are back now. Taking a look at some of the replays. This is early on, Josh. This was the RG versus Electro Giant matchup, and this is the one where Muhammad Light had nothing to do. Great pick here from Lord Sebastian. Yeah, he played this really well, and you have to be so careful about using a deck you've used before against him. Game number two, he just overwhelms completely. Just early on, it looked like he dominated throughout the entire match. Lord Seb was never able to set up any monk balloon push that's that's the that's the entire deck that's the name of the deck i would assume it's called monk balloon and he just never was able to get it off yeah this was a tough one for him but here we are in game number three and i believe this might be the sequence that we're talking about here nato king tower activation from lord seb and just perfectly timed oh and we cut off right before the musketeer does her thing but you saw that nato <laughs> was perfectly timed for the bomber got some good shots out for the musky and then here we are at the end and man just very very close lord sebastian you know you think about it one more lightning cycled in a way that gets on tower versus getting just on troops might change things up a couple of natos on offense which he couldn't use explicitly because of the uh, he couldn't use uh, at will because of the hog rider pressure just a fascinating matchup between two kind of classic archetypes yeah and one thing I I used to love when it was brought up, but it was the leaked elixir. He, he leaked 7.5 elixir, wasn't able to get the lightning off. I mean, we're, we're looking at 0.3 seconds and he gets the lightning off and he wins the game and every the, the entire script gets flipped. So, you know, maybe there was one or two interactions. He could have just been a little bit quicker with his decision making. But I mean, just overall, what an opener to the day. Yeah, a massive opener, and uh, we have our resident beatdown expert here in Juicy J. Juicy, we saw the E-Giant play in game number one. That's your bread and butter, obviously. Um, and I'm going to guess you would say that that was a nearly impossible matchup. But really curious about your thoughts on the last matchup we just saw between the Golem deck and the Hoggy Q. First off, I wouldn't say that match was impossible. He was so close to winning. He just needed that one Gold Knight dash. If you remember that Gold Knight dash blocked by that Barbarian Barrel, it was so close, but Lord Seb just played fan fantastically. In the last match there with the Golem, you know, it was very close. Like you guys said, 150 HP, but it's also literally milliseconds. He had one more lightning down, and he would have won. Maybe just half more elixir, and he, and he had it in hand. The other thing that it could have done, uh, or could have changed that outcome, was like you said, those musketeer shots on the right with the perfect play, play from Muhammad Light. Lord Seb, now with the perfect play, we actually saw in that replay taking a hog hit from one of his tornadoes. Just that one small interaction changed the entire course of that match. Well, talking about course of the match, talking about the course of the event overall, as we do have some movement now in our bracket, Mohamed Light will move on, no surprises here, to face the winner of our next matchup between Mugi and Audriel. So passes the first test, a very close first test, but of course, Passing it is the most important thing. The question is, what will he do against his longtime nemesis in Mugi? Now, of course, one of the many teammates he has on Shot Kalalis or Adriel. And that's going to be a banger of a matchup. And of course, as we saw, Lord Seb will move down to the lower bracket. You do have one life to give in this matchup or in this competition. So Lord Seb has given that one. From now on, he is on the chopping block throughout the rest of his monthly finals journey. And man. Such a close one. And now we move on to our second matchup, which may be the most fire matchup of the day. Adriel and Mugi. The young Adriel, who really now has seemed to come into his own as a top tier pro against our 2021 world finalist in Mugi. And Juicy, I'll start this off with you. The question here really, more than anything, seems to be more on Mo how dedicated is Mugi right now. I'll leave you there with that thought. Uh, to send you with that thought, is Mugi fully dialed in and ready? And how dangerous is Adriel for him in this day? Yeah, it's a great question. You guys talked earlier at the beginning of the cast about how, you know, talented Mugi is, but we didn't really talk about 
the deck side of things. And like we, like I said at the beginning, I think that Audriel has that same coach that Muhammad Light has behind him. Um, that's what I heard anyways. And if that's the case, I can definitely see him taking this match up over Mugi. Um, just because that's what he struggles with most, right? It's the decks that he struggles with most. He's got the talent, but a good matchup, especially with a player of Audriel's caliber, will 100% be enough for him to take this best of three. Um, I know that you picked Mugi Josh and you talked a little bit about his talent earlier today, but um, do you think that his talent is enough to break through versus some good deck picks by Audriel? You know, I don't mind showing a little bit of bias. Uh, I yeah. personally don't care if uh, he showcased enough talent recently. I, I don't care if people uh, don't think that he's not putting in the work. For me personally, I, I, it's he has some of the most beautiful gameplay ever. When he's on, it just seems like he's on. And I, I, it, it, I, I, you know, I kind of compare players to Muhammad Light. But when I think of just beautiful gameplay, I don't think of Muhammad Light. I think of Mugi. So some of his mm -hmm. games are just the most impressive to me. So personally, it, it doesn't matter any of the outside stuff. I will always be a Mugi fanboy, and I will always pick him in a set. And yeah, no surprises there that the God RF's roommate is a big Moogie fanboy. And uh, we'll see Moogie, if they're Moogie, able to... Moogie, 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 Moogie. <laughs> we'll see if we're able to... If he's able to pull this one out here. Talking about Adriel. This is a guy who's had a, a long and a long and interesting journey through Clash Royale. And Josh, I know you were talking about Moogie there, but let's let's talk about Adriel here for a moment. You've competed around him. You've competed against him. You've seen him in, in, in play for a long time. What are the things that make this guy special? Okay, so I'm 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 so happy that you worded it this way because I was taking a look at his gameplay. In the top eight, he went five and one overall in sets. And so yes, that's pretty good, but usually that's what you need to go in order to qualify for these rounds. The really impressive thing about it, he went in all his five sets that he won, he won two zero in that set. So whenever he's dialed in and he gets that game one victory, I feel like it just has to show something. I, I, I'm, I'm going to look at, you know, facial cues and everything because he must gain so much confident, uh, confidence from winning game one. I think the winner of game one wins the set. And yes, that's an easy thing to say. You're up 1-0 in a best of three. But it, it, more so than usual, I think the winner of game one is going to win the set. Little numbers here to give you guys some context in these ones. Overall, games won. Adriel is currently number four on the list for CRL 2023 with 74 games won. And behind him at number six is his opponent, Mugi, a 73% game win rate for Adriel, 68% for his opponent today. So those are some important numbers. But Josh, you bring up a very important point here. The match win rate for Adriel, 81%. And behind him at 69% is Mugi. So Juicy, does that give you any changes or context or thoughts here on where these two players are at right now? Or are those numbers not different enough to mean anything to you? I mean, I think it kind of reinforces what I was trying to say. Audriel getting the good matchups gets the 2-0. Mugi, maybe not getting the best matchups. Maybe having to rely on his skill and his talent in order to take the sets. Maybe losing one match throughout the best of three. Um, so that's kind of just kind of reinforcing what I was thinking earlier. Well, of course, we'll get this match going to you guys very, very soon. Just a short delay getting things kicked off between these two players. And uh, you can see Mugi. I wonder what he's thinking about right now. And Josh, when you have, you've obviously very famously had some major delays when it comes to some CRL competition. What are you thinking about when, what are you doing to try to stay focused when you're trying to work your way through those moments? Well, to to get focused, um, I don't know. That's a that's a really good question. Usually, well, it it, it helps because I was always a two v two player, so I was always talking with my partner. When you're having to dial in yourself, it's it's a lot more difficult. You you can't get in your head, but at the same time, you have to remain focused on the game. So it's kind of just working over matchups usually, and that way you can 
you can kind of just calm yourself down. You say, oh, you know, if I get this matchup, it's going to be an easy win, or I've practiced this one, it's okay if I lose, but, you know, I'm better than everybody else in the world in this specific matchup. So usually you're just thinking about the decks you're going to use, the matchups you're going to go against, and just calming yourself down with that. That's certainly important. Juicy, of course, you've had those long delays, world cyber games, having to having to wait and not just do it at home in the comfort of, of your living room, but do it at the uh, at a big stage here. Let's go ahead and jump into gameplay in just one second here. But Juicy, I'll let you let you off with uh, with that question as you guys take it away for this matchup. Yeah, you know, it's a great question. A lot of people say they listen to music. A lot of people, maybe they're just talking with their coach or maybe even just watching some gameplay, um, just trying to stay focused on the game. But, you know, like what Josh said, just stay focused. You gotta try and tell yourself, I'm the best, I'm the best. I got this, I'm gonna win, you gotta be confident. As we hop into this match, we have Moogie at the top of your screen. It looks like a Drill Cycle deck. We got Audriel at the bottom with a Goblin Hut. Most likely Goblin on Graveyard, but Goblin Hut, so strong right now. Could be used in almost anything. Yeah, I... I've been waiting to ask you. This is actually, I had it written down. Uh, it, it was going to be Ask Juicy about uh, Goblin Hut. So what what are your thoughts on Goblin Hut and specifically this Rascal's Goblin Hut graveyard deck? Do you think it's broken? Do you think it, it, it's possible to lose with it? Uh, should we be seeing it in every single deck or in every single set by both players? Uh, how do you feel about this Goblin Hut? You know, it's an interesting deck. I think it's really strong on ladder specifically just because uh, it has pretty solid matchups overall. It is very OP. I don't think we've seen as much in CRL lately just because um, good players have good workarounds for it. And it's, it's not as consistent as like cycle decks, in my opinion. But when it comes to the Goblin Hut, you know, I think it is a very, very strong card right now. Obviously, the Goblin Hut itself got a little bit of buff not too long ago. But then the Spear Gobs got the buff, and that really is what changed it here. Because now in instances where a Goblin Hut is at 1 HP, maybe because of like a Poison Tick or an Earthquake Tick, they will actually still get hits on the tower. Um, which just forces out so much Elixir throughout the match. And uh, that's why we've seen such a resurgence in usage from the card. That's right, just an extra 200 chip damage every single time going down the lane. It's just so brutal, so so just constricting to how this meta is. So right here, 44 seconds left, Drill going against Rascal's Graveyard. And I would assume this matchup, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but how do you think this matchup is? Do you think it's Drill side just because of how quickly it cycles? Uh, or do you think just the Rascal's Graveyard, it eventually overwhelms? You know, it's a great question and I, Wow, so there's a lot of things happening right now that kind of changes that. You know, I saw the guards come out for Moogie. It's like, okay, this is great for Graveyard. But then I saw Audrey whip out the arrows instead of the barb barrel for those guards. Overall, I would say most likely Audrey has this matchup. Just because without the guards, like if you arrows the guards every time, Moogie can struggle to defend these graveyards. Um, he's doing a great job so far blocking at the bridge, using the guards and the log on the defense. But as we head into overtime, and especially triple elixirs can be increasingly difficult for him to defend. Meanwhile, Audriel, all he has to do to defend a drill is drop that Skeleton King down and um, continue out through the match. Yeah, and right there, I feel like that was kind of unlucky for Mookie. I feel like a lot of the Skeletons just kind of locked onto the tower. The guards were placed correctly, but at the same time, three of the Skeletons spawned on the left side and the guards didn't touch any of them. So that's a massive swing in Audriel's way. But at the end of the day, Moogie is no. Just kidding. I, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That was a that was a pretty bad swing. For some reason, I was reading it as if Audriel wasn't in the lead. But uh, I think it's pretty clear that he, he's up a he's up a little bit. Yeah, Audriel getting that very nice damage lead with the graveyard. That's the thing about the graveyard guys. The only card in Clash Royale is completely reliant on RNG, meaning random number generator. Those skeletons can spawn anywhere in the radius. And sometimes you just get unlucky, like Josh said, and those skeletons spawn on the uh, side of the tower that there's no troop to help take them out. 
And so right there, I love what Mookie's doing with the offset bomb towers. He's placing it off to the side because he just wants to worry about the Goblin Hut. That is how constricting it is overall. Right there, great offense. He takes the lead and the Musketeer high. I, I love these Musketeer plays, uh, both from Mugi and Muhammad Light earlier. It just seems like they're getting so much more value than they're supposed to usually. I, I love how they're playing it. And with 30 seconds left, he now storms back into the lead, 280 HP separate in the two players, and he has to get very aggressive here. Here comes the Drill Fireball. There's three card cycle activated with that Mighty Miner. Here comes a Graveyard and another Drill on the board. 14 seconds left. There's Damage Elite coming in from Audrio. Log's gonna come through here, not gonna get the Skeletons in time. Poison drops, last Drill of the day. Can we see a pre Fireball with this Drill? It drops, arrows go down, Goblin connects, but oh. it's not enough. That's gonna be GG's Audriel. It's gonna take game one versus Moogie. I just, I was not sure the, the numbers were blocking it. I just could not tell if it was gonna be a one HP game or w where my level of excitement was supposed to be. But uh, 200 HP, that's still pretty close. I, uh, I can get, I, I, I can still get excited for that. Yeah, it was a very close match. I think, like I said, Audriel had a good matchup. And going back, what I've been talking about him this entire day. You know, he's got the coach behind him. He's making good deck picks. Maybe Mugi has a higher overall skill level or talent level. But Audrio making some solid plays, staying calm. And he takes a very convincing W. Mugi and Audriel, game number two. Audriel using the Golden Knight plus the Goblin Cage. It's looking like it could be E Giant. Technically, it still could be uh, Royal Hogs and uh, maybe Golem because we saw that earlier. On the other side, Mugi, this is probably going to be the Royal Hogs mirror deck, especially now, now that we've seen the arrows as well. This is going to be a fun deck. I always, I, I. I it's, it's so annoying as a deck overall, but as a commentator, this Giant Skeleton Royal Hogs Mirror deck is my favorite deck in the world to commentate. It is so hectic, and as the game goes on, you just can't keep up with the action, and I love seeing that in, uh, in decks. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, looking at the matchup overall here, I'd say Audrey has an advantage just because he's got that bomber. That's going to help him a lot with the splash damage. He's got the Gold Knight for the Zappies. And he has a Tornado for the Fisherman as well. So as long as he can make... Oh, wait. Fisherman turns back around. It locks onto this. Will it be able to pull this E-Giant off the tower? No. It locked on the Gold Knight. E-Giant still locked, but the tower retargets the Gold Knight, which makes it so the wow. E-Giant does far less reflection damage. Wow. I, I, I hope that we can get a replay on that because that... I, so what happened right there, the tower was locked onto the E-Giant, but then as it was getting Fisherman away, it retargeted onto the Golden Knight. That was a crazy interaction and so advantageous for Audriel. He gets the tower down to 1578, 54 seconds left, 300 HP separate in the two players. And now Mugi is just gonna continue to go Giant Skeleton, same lane, but it's such a problem for him. Just going E-Giant Bridge, Tornado, and then Golden Knight is so difficult to stop. Bar Barrel plus Bomber at the bridge takes care of wow. that, of those Zappies and the Gold Knight Dash makes it all the way tower down to 474. Huge mistakes for Mugi and beautiful plays from Audriel. At this point, he just has to have good defense and he's a couple tornadoes and a lightning away. Yeah, and I always talk about, oh, you know, you gotta give yourself a chance. Uh, you, you gotta, you know, switch up your plays end game to just give yourself an opportunity. But when there's only seven seconds left and it's this late in the game, it's pretty clear that if you're switching lanes that this game is, you know, just technically over. It, it's so difficult at this point. You needed to switch it up earlier, but it, I, I, I think it just comes down to Audriel played the matchup correctly. And I think this is just a really bad matchup for Mookie. He just can't do anything to, to these Tornado E-Giant pushes. Yeah, it's definitely a tough matchup. Um, but at the same time, there's just so many mistakes that were made. And Audriel just capitalized on every single one of those. Yeah, that was flawless gameplay right there. And Audriel, again, same thing as before. He wins game number win, yeah. game number one. He's going to win game number two. I th There's something about it. I, I, I wasn't looking at the facial cues whatsoever, but you can see his little smile creeping on his face. He is excited. What a way to start it off for him. 
And uh, yeah, he's got to feel really good about that set overall. Game number two, though, was so dominant. And I really want to see, I, I, I'm praying, I'm hoping that uh, we get the replay where the tower locks onto the Golden Knight because that, that just changes the game. Absolutely. Here's game one, Graveyard versus Drill. You know, we talked about it, having the arrows for those guards, fantastic deck pick, allowed him to have a very nice matchup in this one. And uh, here's the final of that game. A lot of stuff happened here. Drill plus Fireball, Goblin did connect. So, uh, but it was enough. Arrows came through for Audriel. Game two. Yeah. And here's game number two, I believe. Yes, this is gonna be where it's at. So I, I just wanna, I'm, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be kind of quiet. I'm just gonna be watching. Okay, yeah, I, I, it just retargets out of the Golden Knight. That is so crazy for Audriel. The E Giant at zero and a half HP is able to get the tower down so low. And I mean, I, I, I knew it from the beginning. Uh, you know, not to toot my own horn or anything, but it's just. You, you have a lot of troops, you don't have a big spell, and your opponent has Golden Knight Tornado. It, it just eventually the Golden Knight NATO is going to come out, and eventually it's going to take you out. Doesn't matter how many fishermen, doesn't matter how, how, how many zappies you have, it's just so difficult to stop that one singular push. Audrey getting some very nice matchups here in this best of three, takes the 2-0 sweep, that's going to put him in a fantastic situation going forward in this tournament. I'm really excited to see what he does. Um, I don't know. I mean, taking the 2021 world champ out of the kind of uh, winner's bracket, putting him into the loser's bracket, definitely puts him in a solid spot to maybe win this golden ticket. A uh, very solid spot indeed, folks. Uh, I think that Rich. might be muted in, the, in Discord now. I think about it, boom, there we go. And now we have ourselves all, all sorted out. Boys, very, very solid spot here for uh for adriel but you know you talk about a hard road to a golden ticket yeah he goes from moogie to mohammed light okay so let me even start this here if adriel ends up winning a golden ticket and is able to go through moogie mohammed light and then probably one of those two again at some point will this be the most impressive golden ticket win uh of so far of the year and uh josh go ahead uh, I, I I feel like it's kind of, I mean, I feel like yes, but only because it's against Muhammad Light. Any Anytime you're going to say Muhammad Light's name and you want to battle against him, it just, it has to be, that's the most impressive ticket, which is just, it's unfair because anytime Muhammad Light loses, it, that's when the opportunity arises for a cool golden ticket. So kind of unfair to put off to Muhammad Light, but I totally agree with you. And, you know, speaking of unfair, it maybe feels unfair to anybody to be on the same side of the bracket as Mohammed Light. So now we move to the other side of the bracket where players still have some very brutal matches, but at least we won't have to face him until later. And maybe the most important person for this year, not named Mohammed Light, the guy people are keeping a lot of eyes on, Pedro, currently the points leader amongst players who are not qualified for World Finals already leading that board by quite a bit and putting up one heck of a year. Pedro very, very quietly became suddenly a world-class competitor and someone who's certainly in the mix for uh, for that world championship. Juicy, talk to me about Pedro. You know, Pedro's just a player who's kind of always been there on the ladder and, you know, always at the top every single season. Fantastic to watch him play against the best of the best there. But it seems like he's never really shown his competitive colors um, in tournaments until now. And now he's taking that experience, maybe branching out to other decks. Obviously, we all know he's a minor mortar, poison, kind of quote unquote one trick. But as he branches into better or more diverse decks, he's able to take that into the competitive scene. And he's done quite well for himself so far. Done quite well for himself indeed on the other side of things against Pedro. We have Hugo, Ugo, to give the proper French, pronun French pronunciation. And this is a guy who, you know, uh, there's a lot of history, of course, amongst uh, amongst the French with, with this game. Josh, you played against a, a number of players when they were on Allegiance, or you they were on the EU side, but you knew those players pretty well. Talk about Hugo and the kind of legacy he's trying to carry here with, uh, with, with that community. Yeah, I mean, it's always fun talking about all the French players. I mean, we have Lupangi and I think DK Donkey Kong was also French. Uh, just that entire community from the beginning has always been just so, so talented. And right here, Hugo, he's just the 
one of the best in the world with Hog. I mean, you know, he's so talented overall and, you know, Andrew Guy's favorite player. Uh, but, like, Hog just overall, I, I, I love seeing great players with Hog because it just shows their micro gameplay. Let's go ahead and jump into our match as Josh will take a little break here. Pedro, top of your screen. Ugo at the bottom as they pop off here. And no big surprises, Juicy, on Pedro's yep. side opening up here with Miner. Miner, Poison. Interesting Mighty Miner ability here. Kind of a deflecting log. E Spirit and a Fish Boy going to have to come down for that. Uh, at the bottom here, Monk RG. Interesting matchup. I think it's really going to depend on what kind of building Pedro has in this matchup. If it's an Inferno Tower, he's looking good. No deflection there. It's a cannon. Deflection of the Monk could be a huge issue. And uh, the Bomb Tower kind of in the middle ground there. Interesting adjustment here for Ugo is typically run the RG Giant Skeleton or a Skeleton King version rather than the uh, RG Monk version. Thoughts on why he's picking the Skeleton King version here as opposed to the Monk, uh, uh, the Monk variation, I mean, as opposed to the Skeleton King variation? I think that the Monk version is definitely better against players like Pedro that use quick cycle decks just because you can deflect those Musketeers, maybe those Archer Queens, you can deflect any sort of building to try and get the RG to break through. It's also very strong versus Mighty Miner at the same time. Is able to push back that Mighty Miner and reset his charge up. So here we go, first couple minutes away, and some little bit of damage done both directions, but no one has broken out to a big lead. Is that a problem for Pedro here, Juicy? Does he need to extend a lead a little bit more early on, or can he play solid enough defense and win this with minor poisons late? It's a good question. I think that you're right, that he should have played more than single elixir, but who am I to tell Pedro how to use minor poison? Um, but we'll see. Maybe you're right. Like, maybe later in the match, we're going to be seeing a huge RG connection, and Pedro won't have that early damage lead to make up for that. And some Monk Reflection does finally send this lead back to the direction of Hugo, who so far has been playing more the pull game with the Fisherman than the catch game. Money Miner ability going to take out this Phoenix on the left hand side and as well as the Fisherman. Fireballs always dropping from both players onto the glass cannons in the situations. Um, just kind of chilling. I mean, just waiting for a solid play. And here it goes, oh, Hugo, finally getting an RG in the back. Maybe we're going to be seeing a double RG dual lane pressure as we head into overtime. RG behind Monk, left-hand lane, minute 43 remaining. Miner plus Goblins just trying to get some DPS down, but still the Monk's gonna get in range. Does not reflect the bomb tower though. That is helpful and back to another bomb tower is Pedro. A massive Monk third shot. Will that be enough for an RG to get a shot? And it's just barely not. That Monk third punch is so valuable. And one of the things not talked about as much as maybe the reflection ability as that's maybe a little bit less obvious than the first one but that was a potentially huge moment either way pedro doing a good job of holding off so far and another royal giant with no connection triple elixir juicy keys to victory on both sides Monk at the bridge rg gonna happen soon he needs in order to win this game he needs to get that to monk reflecting the bomb tower for Pedro, he needs to continue to pull that back, have a good micro to keep the RG off the tower, and he needs to get a minor connection. You know, we talked about Pedro, or we talked about Hugo's, or Pedro's really good defense, but Hugo's been doing a great job with that as well, bringing the minor hits everywhere. Does he vary? Yes, I was questioning whether or not Pedro's gonna start varying up those positions. Does do a good job of it here. Gets the extra two minor shots with that fireball. 25 seconds left. A lot of DPS on the Royal Giant. No, the a little bit of movement. The cycling of bomb towers has been excellent from Pedro, but he cannot afford to give away a lot of Royal Giant shots, and that is a big one. Huge Royal Giant shot. Musketeer down very low. Miner does get on tower, trying to take away. Is there a fireball that direction? There is. Is there one the opposite direction? Can he get it off? Oh, just dies in the air. You see the look of disappointment and Pedro able to hold off and get the win here in game number one. What a photo finish.
Fantastic plays from both players. Like I said, Hugo needs to get that monk reflecting that bomb tower to get the RG through, and that's just what he did. Pedro tried to block the river on the left hand side of the end there with the goblins. The mighty miner also trying to take that monk out before the ability popped. But the ability got down in range of the bomb tower just barely, taking it out, allowing for that one RG hit, and the fireballs were able to secure it after that. Wallbreakers split behind King Tower. Now, obviously, Juicy Mohammed Light is known for favoring that move a lot. What's the value behind splitting behind King Tower versus the more common that's been for the last few years, splitting at the bridge when you open? So the biggest thing is you split the bridge, and it makes it obviously you know Wallbreakers most likely gonna get a positive elixir trade, but it is possible to you know maybe counter it positive or evenly with like maybe set of goblins or even possibly for some skeletons by doing it in the back you can react to whatever they do or force them to leak elixir and for example you go skeletons maybe hugo just goes for zap and now you have to reply again you have to spend more elixir on those wall breakers so that's kind of the reasoning on why you play them in the back rather than at the bridge here goes the goblin hut the graveyard deck that might be enough to I've I've heard rumors that a former top world graveyard player might be making a comeback this month for this deck alone so we'll see if that comes to fruition but this really has become the dominant and maybe at the same vein juicy most hated deck in the meta right now yeah I say it all the time my stream but nobody and I mean nobody wants to be playing against huts or double huts it is very strong right now like we talked about earlier you know, always getting those Spear Goblin hits. Hugo, not having his big spell in this matchup either, gonna be even more difficult for him to deal with those Goblin hunts. Is there anything to Hugo's ability to stack deep in his own territory and turn into a flood of troops the opposite direction? Absolutely, you know, once we get into Tub Elixir, which is happening right now, Pedro's got a pretty quick cycle with the Skeletons in this variation. He can definitely stack up Goblin hunts. And uh, like you said, he can even put them all in one lane while making a push on the other to create that dual lane pressure. Mega Knight setting up way low here. And there's just so much, you know, you, you talk about the Goblin Hunt on one side, you add in the Rascals, you add in the Skeleton King ability, and it's just absolute clog city here, or as you might call it, a Prince's Waking Nightmare in this matchup and here we go prince gonna go ahead and work on the left hand side to defend against the rascals push with 14 seconds left yeah we've seen so much of this uh mega knight prince minor deck lately in clash in the clash Royale league but i was wondering why we haven't seen it as much as we did earlier this season but i think this is deck is the reason why look how terrible this matchup is for hugo not only, like you said, is he ever going to get any value from the Prince, but he only has one spell. He has the arrows. He has to decide, do I use it on the Goblin Do I use it on the Rascals? Do I use it in the Graveyard? It's so tough. And then on Pedro's end of things, he can just poison these Zappies all day. Phoenix gets so much value versus the Mega Knight. Skelly King ability, another thing that Hugo has to save the arrows for. It's just, it's not happening. Just the inability to get to that goblin hut in the middle we'll see if hugo starts trying to get creative with his approach to that one but it's looking more and more like a clean 2-0 here is likely for pedro in this matchup sets up mega knight one more time triple elixir coming fairly soon and does not feel like that's going to do any favors for hugo Absolutely not. I just want to point out Pedro hasn't played a single graveyard this game. He's completely relying on the Goblin Hunt as his win condition. Arrows, Prince, Mega Knight push on the right side, trying to make something happen, but it's not enough. Easy defense, and here comes the first graveyard of the game on the left-hand side. Graveyard plus poison, and you can see in the gallery, people throwing the beatdown emoji, the wave the white flag emoji, and an archer in there for some reason, not entirely sure why. Either way, all expressing the thing that we're seeing here on screen that Pedro's got this one pretty much locked down. Yep, beautiful game from Pedro with the deck pick, but also the gameplay. Hugo knows this over. He starts leaking some elixir and he 
lets it go. Pedro going to take a clean 2-0 sweep here in this best of three, going to continue on in this winner's bracket. Yeah, that one that one had to hurt if you're on the on the side of Hugo. You know, you, we've talked about that a lot. There's been some matchups today where you're just kind of stuck in a position. And you know, that's one of the, the one of the challenges here of using the uh, the in-game duel system, right? Is I you know, you get curious, especially when you talk about games two and game three, when you're looking at the decks that you've pre-prepared already, and sometimes you're like, oh man, I have a feeling this is coming, but I don't have any changes that I can make. And that feeling must be pretty frustrating sometimes. But we've also seen players like Muhammad Light work through it. So it's a, it's a challenging place to be in on occasion when matchup rears its ugly head. Yeah, I mean, you make a great point. Like with the in-game duels, it's just you can't make a change. But one thing we didn't talk about, maybe he just didn't have a single deck that was able to counter that graveyard deck. And maybe that was the best chance he had. And it just wasn't there. Well, either way, Pedro with a quick 2-0, and it's a, a day so far for the young players. We saw Lord Seb do a great job against Mohamed Light, getting that very, very razor-thin close to get that matchup. Adriel blowing through Mugi. Now Pedro just completely running right through Hugo. It's been a big one, and we'll, of course, talk about the next upcoming matchup fairly soon, but it does raise questions of what might happen with Sosa and Faust. Is this a trend, or are these just isolated incidents either way? Really nice work here from Pedro. And game number one, Hugo had some opportunities here, Juicy. Yeah, something I didn't really notice till now is if you notice in the previous part of that replay there, the perfect placements from Pedro with the minor, um, preventing the fisherman from pulling was huge there. Uh, it just wasn't able, it wasn't enough because of that very nice connection uh, earlier. Uh, or I guess it was enough. Well, that, I'm going to take what I said back. I forgot. Pedro actually did win game one there, which is absolutely beautiful. That play definitely held the hand with game two. I mean, we saw it. Really not much that Hugo could do in this situation. Pedro really struggling to do anything versus those goblin hunts. Yeah, this was an absolutely brutal matchup, and Pedro taking care of business very, very easily. I don't know who he's working with, by the way, so... Uh, we don't really have any insight as to maybe we can get some from somebody on who might be helping Pedro with his preparations. Either way, really good work here overall and painting his opponent into an absolute corner. Game number one, always back to the bomb towers. And I think that was the most impressive thing for me, Juicy, was how well Pedro managed cycle in game one. Yeah, the cycle was great. The micro was great to pull the monks away from the RGs and also just blocking the bridge, preventing those monk chip damage throughout the match. And game two, you know, we talked about it a million times. I mean, I think that Hugo just needs something, maybe like a Mother Witch instead of the Zabbies in this deck. He had that. That could have changed the course of this match. Mother Witch so good versus the Goblin Knight as well as the Graveyard here. Well, that's it for match number three. Hugo coming out with the L, but of course, down but not out. We'll look at our bracket here in just one moment. Josh, thoughts on the matchup we just watched? You said, I, I was trying to write it down, but I couldn't. Uh, a prince's waking nightmare or walking yes. nightmare? Waking nightmare. Yes. Waking nightmare. Okay. I wrote that down. I thought, I thought that was brilliant. Uh, as far as gameplay goes, uh, Pedro is unreal. I, I, I forgot to mention it at the beginning of the show. I think that out of all the players, he's kind of my player to watch to be able to just win a golden ticket outright. I think he's so talented. And just in that game, it, it was the minor fireballs. You, you know, he finally switched up the minor positions, which won him the game, obviously. But it was the timing of the fireballs on top of the hunters that were played on the incorrect tiles where the hunter was about to shoot. But then the fireball knockback reset the hunter. I, I, I just thought that was so brilliant from him. Well, let's take a look at the results of that brilliance as Pedro will move forward in our bracket. And very important here, we talked about this earlier, being on the opposite side of the bracket from Mohamed Light. Of course, we'll see if Mo gets through Adriel, but Pedro now awaiting the winner of Faust and Sosa. So while both those guys certainly talented players, and we'll talk more about them in just a moment, definitely not the same fear factor as you might see against Mohamed Light. No one's trying to jump off a bridge or eat live spiders here in this one for Pedro. So nice spot for him to be in against one of these two. And now we move on to our next one. Of course, keep in mind, 
As you can see, the lower bracket, Mugi versus Lord Seb, but Hugo still in the mix as well. Let's talk about this matchup right in front of us, though. Josh, Sosa versus Faust, and you and I both picked Sosa in this one. Let's go to Juicy here first, actually. Juicy, you picked Faust. After seeing what we've seen today, are you still going with the, as you put it, more consistent veteran? Yeah, I gotta go with him. You know, he's gonna have some solid deck picks, I already know. You know, he's looking confident already today. Um, I think that Sosa is just a little bit more prone to the nerves. And I think that plays a huge factor in these monthly finals. And looking at this, you know, Faust is one of the few players in this competition, Josh, whose number one deck isn't Hog Rider or for some people, Royal Giant. Number one most played Drill, number two most played Royal Hogs. Thoughts on some of that information here from Faust? Okay, so uh, I think it was the top th or the the round of 32 uh, decks that I was looking at from this month, and then uh, the March monthly finals as well. And I classified every single deck. I think it was like 26 decks or 28 decks in those round of 32s, where they were either uh, control or beatdown slash control. Like every, every single deck he uses is just gonna control the pace of the game. And that's just Faust's MO. He, he just wants to control the game from start to finish. We'll see Juicy back here in a little bit. Let's go ahead and jump into it between Faust and Sosa. Another note here, Sosa, eight different win conditions played on his season three journey so far. Faust a little deeper here with 11 different looks, including Lava Hound, Balloon, and Ram Rider. So certainly some more variation out of Sosa, of course, or out of uh, Faust. Here we see him opening up though with Electro Jump. He doesn't choose to reset the Golden Knight. That's pretty shocking to me. I totally don't disagree with it, but that usually we see these players reset with a Golden Knight on top of the Mighty Miner. It's it's interesting that he chose not to do it. He just, I mean, this is, this is why Faust is so enjoyable to watch because he makes plays that other players wouldn't. When, when he's running these control decks, he just wants to slow the pace of the game. And that is so cool to see him play this matchup the way he is. I, I don't think a lot of people would even lightning that Musketeer. They would choose a different card. So just, it's it's exciting to see how he attacks each matchup. We have seen players look more at early lightning cycle with this Electro Giant deck as of late. So we'll see if Faust continues that and if Sosa keeps giving him opportunities with those muskies played low. Pressure play on the right-hand side from Sosa with the minor guards play. Sosa, personal best on Legacy Ladder, 87-58. Currently ranked 16th overall on our points leaderboard. And Faust right here, just setting up his defense. Golden Knight going to be able to cross the bridge, going to take out the wall breakers instead of attacking the Musketeers. And Sosa, he, he has to fe be feeling pretty good. He's played a great game so far. But, I mean, as this game goes on and on, he's going to need to continue to swap lanes. And right here, I mean, just a minute left. I, I love how much damage he has on both lanes. He's setting himself up for success as the game goes on. Whoa. Wow. Musketeer played directly onto the Electro Giant. And maybe that was not wanting to give the Musketeer to the Lightning. And this is going to end up being some significant damage here, Josh. One bomber shot in and a healthy E-Giant high. NATO pulls in the musky one more time. These Musketeers feel like they are being sacrificed to some deity from an ancient civilization right now. <laughs> I'm definitely going to have to rewatch. I, I, I want to start using uh, what, what you're doing in my own commentary because it, it, these are just great. I, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed them. Oh, well, I appreciate it. And I'll keep them coming just for you there, Josh. Here we go. Sudden death overtime, under two minutes left. Pressure play on the right hand side. The NATO looking to clean up. Wall breakers almost not quite there. None of the wall breakers hit, but the NATO was used. So if he can get the Musketeer back in cycle, he would have been able to start a push on the right side. Instead, going to have to go in on the left. Miner on top of the cannon. So that way the wall breakers go for the tower. But clean defense once again from Faust, just controlling the game. And with 600 HP, I mean, it really comes down to if Faust wins this game, he's going to win it because of that Musketeer from Sosa. I, I, it's still so shocking. He, he didn't he didn't get overwhelmed from it, 
but just way too much damage to be giving up and just a huge elixir loss from that one singular musketeer. And lightning to go bomb tower plus musketeer. It really seems like Sosa's having difficulty finding out how he wants to spread the lightning thin. Has not done a phenomenal job of that. Here we go, triple elixir down by a mile and change at the moment. And a nice little prediction wow. log here, not able to get the connection though. Wow, and Musketeer is going to lock onto the tower because of that pre-log. Phenomenal play from Sosa, and that's how you're gonna, if, I mean, that's the way to bring it back if you're him. Miner on top of the tower, is it going to lock onto the tower? It does, so that's another great interaction from Sosa. An 840 to 880, he now takes the lead with 22 seconds left. Poisons are finally in. Log trying to push back. That Electro Giant does get it done. Musketeer high this time. And Faust now trying to create some barriers here. Wall Breakers plus Miner. Miner Poison. NATO does wow. not go. Faust tries to get both sides. Can't do it. And Sosa just runs right through that tower. I'm the juggernaut, he says, and takes us into game number two. That is a phenomenal way to finish the game. You can easily just get it inside your head for making a mistake the way he made that mistake with the Musketeer, but he forgets about it with a minute left. How do I win this game? Well, I need to get a pre-log, so he gets the pre-log. Well, I can't place the Miner in the back because he's going to prediction NATO in the back to the King Tower, so I'm going to place it on the side. Same as always, I'm not going to give you the opportunity to predict me. We talk all the time about, oh, switching the Miner predictions or switching the Miner placements. That time he didn't, and that time he got rewarded for it. That is just such a strong way to finish game number one on Sosa's end. Looking like might be Hog Mortar versus Minor Wall Breakers. And good pick up there with the Valkyrie for Sosa. Forces out the Mighty Miner in response. Doesn't want to give up a uh, uh, Spear Lance hit from the Royal Delivery. And right there with a minute into the game, no damage done from Sosa. Just a little bit of baby damage on Faust's end. And Sosa has run variations of this deck before, usually with Inferno Tower, not with the Mortar. But we're seeing, of course, this kind of quick version. Lately, it's been mostly the Giant Skeleton, the pairing for Hog Rider. Thoughts on why he's going Valkyrie here, Josh? Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's just gotta be because of who he's playing against. This is something I noticed in a lot of the players, and I think I might have actually noticed it with Sosa specifically. Okay, so Sosa, uh, when he was going against Alperen, he used an RG Lightning deck instead of RG Fireball like most people do. So one of the things that I really like about Sosa's game is that he's willing to do slight deck adjustments depending on who he's playing against. And so right here, he must think that the delivery Valk is gonna be better against uh, Faust deck just because it's a lot of control-oriented decks. Right here, the Royal Delivery, depending on how much value it gets throughout the game, that could be the reason why he advances from round number one. Queen does go down, no significant damage here. 42 seconds remaining in standard time, and no one's broken this one wide open. Faust does have the lead, and now gonna hog in front of the mortar here. Miner does get picked up by the goblins. There does not seem to be a mortar connection in the cards for Sosa on this one, despite some significant effort trying to make that one happen. Going to activate the ability perfectly, and it's going to be able to walk over, take out the Musketeer as well. So Ice Spirit, Hog, EQ, that's what we're going to be seeing for the rest of the game, because you're right, uh, we're, we're not seeing any of the Mortars lock onto the tower so hard just because that Musketeer and the Goblin's distraction, it's just so, so strong against these Mortars. Delivery gets there just in time. Faust with a nice lead, 2694 to 2375, as so some Mortars up the left-hand lane. One more time, control has been the name of the game for Faust so far, as you've talked about before, but in this case, controlling the action very, very well. Minor plus musky right-hand side forces the Valk out, and the Queen just cannot find a path. And, you know, you're talking about the value, you know, the delivery has its value, but also it makes it very hard for uh, Sosa to find any way past those goblins. 
That's right. He he's struggling a lot to get the damage that he needs, and I mean, it's I I think once it hits triple elixir, these mortars are going to be a lot more effective because you're going to be able to cycle out multiple mortars all at the same time. But right now, every single time he's defending with the bomb tower, but he's also applying pressure so that way he can't go in with a hog right after. So I, I love how he's approaching uh, his defenses to these mortars. And will this get a mortar lock? And finally, there is one. That's a huge mortar out of Sosa. Force the log to the left-hand side. Now Hog EQ making its pressure play in that same lane. 2,300 HP on the left-hand side. About 600, meh, 500 behind his opponent here as Miners come in. Miner Poison will be aggressive in these final few moments. 33 seconds left, has to go on the attack. But I mean, every single time he's defending it so, so, so well and he, he just can't get past it. Yes, you have Earthquake. Yes, you have Hog Quick Cycle, but it's not quick enough, and it, it's just not enough overall. He, he's getting close, but uh, actually, this is getting really close, especially if he doesn't get the Bomb Tower in time. This Valk Hog, it could be dangerous. Wow, wow, Hog gets one. Hog gets two. Hog does not get three. Is there an Earthquake here for Sosa? There may be. Can the Hog get it in time? No. What a thin margin that one was decided, and under 100 HP sends us to game number three. Yeah, Faust was able to collect his thoughts. Game number two, he played a very solid game overall, getting the damage that he needed, applying pressure, but really it comes down to how he defended those mortars. Every single time it was with the Musketeer or the Bomb Tower, Bomb Tower usually, and then he applied pressure opposite lane so he couldn't go in that it was a masterclass on how to defend those control mortar miner decks. And graveyard for Faust. And we'll see if this just clogs up the lane against this, what looks like E-Giant. E Giant going against Goblin Hut Rascal or Goblin Hut Skeleton King, probably going to be Rascals as well, uh, but definitely not confirmed just yet. And uh, yeah, there we go. We do see the Rascals Inferno Dragon locking onto the Skeleton King, so that's good. And if he chooses, he could go in with a dash, but no, he's just going to go in with the E Giant push, and I really like that. We could see a NATO dash right here, and that's exactly what we're going to see. Taking out the Zappies because they're locked onto the E Giant, that is a great push for Sosa. And Inferno Dragon's gonna get on the board here. There's no snowball, snowball in cycle. Arrows have to come out. That's a ton of sizzle. Welcome to the barbecue, Faust Sosa, making dinner for one. Well, and Faust, I mean, take a look at his deck. He doesn't have a big spell. Usually this deck is going to have those poisons to be able to cycle throughout the match. And right here, he, he doesn't have it. So these E-Giant pushes, he's going to be able to stack behind the E-Giant with no problem whatsoever. And he could choose to Lightning out if he wants to. He could just try and get a little bit of damage and then one Golden Knight NATO. He is in a prime position with a minute and 18 seconds left. Little reset here from both players. Slight Elixir advantage for Faust, but a lot of ground to make up as he sets up that Goblin Hut to the left-hand side. It's a tempting target for, for the Lightning there, Josh. Yeah, absolutely. He, I, I like that he's Goblin Hutting right here the way he is, just because you don't have to worry about the uh, lightning coming down. But I think in the future, he's not going to be placing the Goblin Hut necessarily in uh, the middle of the arena. And right here, Mother Witch is going to go to work. That it, 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 it just comes down to he has no big spell, and so it, it's just going to get too much value. And take a look. I was laughing at the look on Faust's face when he saw that Mother Witch came out. Just kind of a, oh, come on, man. And E-Giant <laughs> down in front, big push behind. No Elixir here for the Lightning might not matter as the Zappies come out. And a great NATO, but the Golden Knights not gonna be able to turn and join that push, doesn't matter. Good reflection damage from the E-Giant gets that down to 618. And now we'll see what Faust does with this push on the right-hand side. 
Yeah, I, 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 I like what he's doing. I just don't think it's going to matter necessarily. The tower is going to lock onto the skeletons instead of the baby dragon until the last one. So Whoa. he's going to also need to defend right there. In 1361, had he got the prediction on top of the Mother Witch, that could have been something massive. Instead, he's going to be able to clean it up nicely. And I, I, don't, I don't know if he's supposed to get aggressive on the right side or just kind of sit and wait back. But Faust has brought himself back into the game. He, he still has a lot more work to do, but I love that push. Uh, that was a huge, potentially game-changing moment for Faust. Graveyard can certainly turn things on their head very quickly, and we just saw that there. Baby Dragon had no response. The NATO tried to clean things up, and now Faust is on the offensive, has the pressure in, and will not be far from another Graveyard here. Yeah, and right here, EJ into the push. That's a... I, I, I love this play right here. I, I, I think he needs to kind of reset everything. The E-Giants are always going to be able to distract everything, but this is a lot coming down the lane. That is a great dash, and that's gonna clean up almost all of it. Just allow him to reset. He's okay, 47 seconds left. He can choose to defend if he wants to, instead of trying to get aggressive. But at the same time, that's also a great aggressive E-Giant. He needs to still apply pressure that way he can't just graveyard until the game is over. Mother Witch and Bomber are huge. Look at that pig get away on the right-hand side. Pig doing a whole lot of damage here. Second one will touch, and now suddenly this game has totally changed. Sosa just waiting to get the elixir here for that lightning and NATO, and he might not even need both here. 15 seconds left. We're going to see the lightning, I believe, on the right-hand side. Really taking his time. Instead of playing the Lightning NATO, he's choosing to play defense. And the Lightning comes in at the very last second, gets it done. GG, well played. Sosa with the Game 3 win over Faust. I would love to be in the ear of Sosa and his coach or wh whoever he's on the mic with because I guarantee you, okay, I can't guarantee it, but I think he might not have known his damage. I, I, I think there's a chance that he wasn't sure if Lightning and Tornado would have taken out the tower. So I really want to know if they were talking about that uh, through the earpiece. Yeah, that's that's one of those ones where, you know, you, you partially want to have those comms available and also <laughs> partially don't want to open up the floodgates of what type of language might be going back and forth in those comms, especially in those very tense moments. Either way, the defense got it done in this one. And, you know, you talked about that, Josh, coming into this matchup, uh, into this match overall, how critical the defense was with Faust being a control player. And in the end, Sosa playing the control in these ones. Yeah, Sosa's game number one. I mean, to, to make the Musketeer mistake and then come back and win, it, it, it's it's levels to... I, I just don't know how you make a mistake that big and you still have the right mindset. That is so cool to see. And this is one of these really cool stats that I was going to throw out at you. Out of the top eight, Sosa is third in individual achievements. He just plays tournaments over and over and over again. So he's always ready. If he makes a mistake, he has the mindset. He's played a thousand different uh, tournaments. And so he knows that he can come back from those mistakes. I, I love that in players where they're just grinding in order to give themselves a chance. And you gotta think about how important that Inferno Dragon connection early on getting so much damage for Sosa against Faust was kind of a, a game changing connection in that game number three between these two and let's go back take a look at the decks here game number one sosa going minor wall breakers control here and getting a a big win you talked about it here against faust yeah i mean game number one it, it it's minor and pre-logs and minor and tornadoes it, it's so much damage once you hit that triple elixir mark but i think it really comes down to I mean, yes, the pre-log was great, but I love the fact that he didn't switch up the miner in the end. So many players are ready for you to put it in the back because that's kind of the most difficult thing. Faust goes in with a pre-nado and it doesn't matter because he still places it to the side. I thought that was really cool from Sosa. Game number two, it was the hog EQ versus now the reverse with the minor poison control and this one, Faust able to get a big win. Some some close moments there where Sosa got some hogs through and made it very interesting. But of course, Faust 
coming out on top on that one. Then we go into the swing matchup in game number three, the E Giant. And I mean, this was already a, a tough one here for Faust. The Electro Dra or the Inferno Dragon connection was a massive game swing. But Josh, the look on his face when he saw that Mother Witch came out <laughs> seemed like it definitely spelled the end. Yeah, yeah, I, I that, that's hilarious, and I can't wait to go back and watch over that because I missed it. I I, I would have loved to see him, him just groan in disgust when you see that mother. Which one thing I really liked from Sosa in that final one, he gave up a lot of damage at the end of the game, but he started e giantning into the same lane, so that way it could stop everything at the bridge and he could reset. I like that he made that adjustment late game. Juicy thoughts on what we just saw here between Sosa and Faust. Yeah, so I think game one, it was really interesting. Like, I think that Faust had it in the bag. And I think Sosa did a great job of just kind of doing everything he could to come back. Um, but it just wasn't end up being enough. In that last game, though, you know, you guys talked about it. Really tough matchup for Faust, right? The Mother Witch, the Gamma, and the Graveyard. In front of Drag for the Baby Dragon. The Zappies were there. But the Gold Knight and the Bomber also played a big role there versus the Zappies in the Goblin Hunt. And um, yeah, it seemed like he was, even despite all those things, it seemed like Faust was playing well and he was kind of choking it. But like Josh said, he adjusted. He started blocking at the bridge, preventing any sort of counterplay. And the Mother Witch did a great job of just finishing out the game, preventing any sort of graveyard damage. Maybe if Faust had a big spell in his deck, like a fireball or poison, deal with that Mother Witch and get more chip damage throughout the match. He could have taken that win. Well, either way, that's in the past. Let's look at the future as our brackets are all set, are all set here. And now in the lower bracket, we have four players all on the chalky, chopping block. Lord Seb versus Moogie. One of those two will be going home in our next matchup of the day. And then Hugo versus Faust. Again, all of those are elimination matches. And then we'll round out our day in the upper bracket semifinals with some bangers. Mohamed Light versus Adriel and Pedro versus Sosa. So we'll take a look at those ones uh, when they come up. Folks, this is uh, this has certainly been an exciting day. And speaking of excitement, let's take a look at our predictions going into these ones. And I'm going to go ahead and and lead things off here. Uh, I went super spicy, boys. I went really spicy here, picking Sosa and picking Lord Seb in our lower bracket matchups. Um, or yeah, I, I I think that match four oh, never mind picking faust and audriel i mean uh seb and faust I, mean, I am all over the place and where we are here <laughs> faust match five match six uh picking lord seb in his matchup over moogie and uh picking audriel in his matchup over muhammad light and i see i'm not alone on the audriel muhammad light train here josh you're joining me on that one yeah, I, I, I've just been so impressed by Adriel in the recent months and just after today and after his performance in order to qualify for today even, just 5-0 uh, sweeps in the round of 32 and then he's going to sweep to start today. His confidence has to be through the roof and, you know, just like Pedro, I think Adriel has the second best chance to just run away with the bracket. He can win a golden ticket himself and I wasn't a believer until today, and now I am a true believer in Audriel. Well, talking about the matchup coming next, so far I am undefeated in picks, and this is a big question. Will I remain undefeated? Lord Seb over Moogie. I'm going to back up my pick here. Moogie didn't look great in his matchup, and Lord Seb, despite the close loss, looked like he's playing at his top level. So I'm picking Lord Seb in this matchup against Moogie. We'll see if he's able to uh, to keep me in the winner's column and expand that gap between you guys. But uh, both y'all picking Moogie in this one. Juicy, you're going with the 2021 world champion. You know, it's hard not to. Um, you know, I think Lord Seb, like you said, played very well. He took a game off. He took first game off of Mom Light in our first match of the day. Moogie, he definitely struggled, but you know I still have the confidence in him to make this happen and continue on throughout the losers bracket here. Um, you know, out of all of the upcoming matches, you know, even the Audrey versus Muhammad Lai, I think everything, all the picks he made are 100% fair. I think this is the one that is definitely the most kind of quote unquote dark horse ish pick. So I'll be interested to see what happens as we hop into it. Game one, here we go. 
I agree, Juicy. I, I, I think it was a bad pick from Rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it's like that. Maybe, maybe he's just, a, maybe just clairvoyant though. Maybe it's just gonna happen right here. You know, Moogie's starting this game off pretty well already. Gonna have a monk ability here for this magic archer potentially. Zappies though do a great job of counting that as well. And he just goes in with a arrow snowball instead of using the monk ability, forcing another response. Really like that play. Yeah, right there. He's able to also time it up so that way the monk gets the uh, the third push shot on top of the uh, mini P.E.K.K.A. So that was a really good play. And speaking of really good plays, that mini P.E.K.K.A. not going to the archers, going for the tower. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is always just like knowing his priorities. And right there, absolutely knew the priority. He had to go to the tower, and that's exactly what he did. Great start for Lord Seb. And this is getting ridiculous. Uh, like, Rich is not supposed to be able to predict all of these. If uh, yeah, this if this insane. one's correct as well, uh, I'm not going to be happy. Yeah, I don't know if it was a great by play by Lord Sub or more of just a mistake from Mugi, just kind of under defending here. Maybe he thought that after the first archer died to the drill, it, Mini Pekka would have gone to the second one, but that was just not the case. Let's look at the matchup here a little bit. We do have Mugi at the bottom with the Monk Balloon Miner with the Arrow Snowball. Lord Seb at the top with the drill kind of bridge spam. Magic Archer, Gold Knight, NATO combo is going to happen a lot here in this match as well. So, like, what so, are you thinking, like, matchup-wise? Well, okay, so, I mean, it, really, at this point, it just gets weird because he gave up so much early yeah. damage. But, at the same time, Lord Seb is using a deck that doesn't have a big spell, and Moogie kind of has a deck that can defend sort of well against it. He can cycle the archers in the back. The monk is always going to get value because it doesn't allow the magic archer to get aggressive. So there's a lot of things he can do, but at the same time, it's just so weird because he gave up so much early damage. It just gets so difficult as this game goes on. I think that these monk abilities definitely get a lot of value. And I think, like you said, as long as he can get an arrow snowball down, he should be able to break through the zappies on the offense with his balloon. At the same time, having this double small spell and having no Barbro or Log definitely is what's putting him in this early damage deficit. Not having a good way of dealing with those goblins from the drill. So as we head into overtime, an overwhelming lead for Lord Seb. But really, I mean, it, I, I, you only need one monk reflection and one actual good balloon push. And, and you're golden. That, that, that's just what it is. And so right here, he gets the loon. He will be able to activate the King Tower if he pulls off the interaction correctly. He absolutely does. Tower down to 1880. But King Tower now activated for Lord Seb. You have the Zappies and you have the Tornado. It's going to be very difficult because the Monk Reflection doesn't reflect on Zappies. And those are so, so good against those loon pushes. Absolutely. Great arrows for Moogie here. Gonna clean up the zappies and damage that uh or that magic archer quite well. Here comes the drill and the counter push though. Are we gonna see a monk ability here? There it goes. Monk ability gonna deflect his magic archer, but also does a great job of preventing a NATO gold knight dash. Monk is not able to be pushed or pulled by a tornado while in his ability state. So right there, solid. He's getting the game. I mean, he's just resetting the game basically only 400 hp separating them at this point in time going to go in with the high bomb tower and nothing to uh defend the mini peck of plus golden knight there's an opportunity for that to become a push but no he defends it quite well at this point and i mean at this point oh at this point he's going to be trying to go in with the uh the miner i believe for the chip damage on top of the tower but tower down to 390, it's going to be so difficult for him to come back at this point. Another thing we haven't really talked about is the fact that Moogie has mistimed every single golden or monk ability he's done this game and never fully killed a magic archer. And throughout the match, that adds up a lot. And uh, I don't know, maybe Rich is right. Maybe Moogie just isn't playing to his full standard, his full like ability. Lord Seb going to take game one very dominantly. And he, uh, he's got a huge advantage for the rest of his best of three. He's just got to take one more game off of the 2021 world champ for the upset and to knock him out of the bracket. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great point. And I was kind of recognizing it, but I wasn't 
really thinking about it. But you're absolutely right. The Monk Reflection should have been able to take out the Magic Archer. And I think it, it, it's so odd for me to say this, but in game number one, Lord Seb was the better player. It's, it's yeah. not matchup related in any way whatsoever. He was the better player in, in, in game number one. He dominated throughout, got an early lead, and then just kept the pedal to the metal. I loved his game number one. Yeah, I absolutely agree with everything you made said there. Really nice log here from Lord Seb. I'm gonna push that or attempt to push the musketeer into rain or into the range of where the giant skelly bomb would be. But after the log nerf, it's not possible to do that anymore. Musketeer is going to be nicely protected, forcing out a queen and the ability and get hit on the tower. So right there, Moogie making me eat my words just a little bit. Great early start for him. Gonna try and get the Ice Spirit chip on top of the tower. Hog plus EQ potentially. No, just gonna go in with a Mortar on defense. And so we're looking at Hog, Mortar, Earthquake. We're going against a Giant Skeleton, Hog, Earthquake on the opposing side. So it's gonna come down. How is Lord Seb supposed to approach this game? Is he going to try and set up multiple Giant Skeletons or is it the Archer's uh, Queen uh, chip? What's the best method for Lord Seb to get past this mortar on defense? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the biggest thing with these Hog EQ mirror matchups are the champion. Whoever gonna basically keep their champion alive in a better way, preserve their three card cycle for their earthquake cycle, but also just to try and out cycle each other's uh, building with the Hog Rider. Like that's what matters the most. And that's why I'd say Mugi has a slight advantage here. It's because the Mighty Miner does a lot better job of staying alive because of his health for the ability, but also just because his ability not only does it doesn't go invisible, it goes and completely switches the lane, which can allow you to keep your Mighty Miner alive for a lot longer. So right there, there were two little micro mistakes from both players. Uh, on Lord Seb's side, he misses the Earthquake. He, he places it a tile too high, and so it doesn't uh, lock on in the Mortar. And then on the other end, Lord Seb, I, I believe... No, uh, Mugi like, played a card too high or something. So a, a, a lot of mistakes from both players right there. Right now, Lord Seb, he, he just can't get through. This defense overall, even with that one mistake, is just too solid. These Mighty Miners are getting way too much value. Takes out another Giant Skeleton. And I mean, it, it's taking out the Giant Skeleton while also not allowing the Archer Queen to get any value. The Archer Queen got no shots on that Musketeer. And I feel like right now we are seeing the Moogie that we know and love. He's playing perfectly. Lord Seb has not touched his tower. The prediction logs on the guards. The Hog Riders always seeming to be able to get through for a hit. Maybe something that we haven't talked about. Uh, or maybe like a reason for why Moogie didn't play great in game one. Or hasn't uh, won. Or didn't win his uh, match one either. Is maybe he's just playing some deck he's uncomfortable with. Maybe that's why we see him run into some tough matchups. Maybe he's trying for some better matchups, but playing decks he's uncomfortable with. But now as he goes to something more comfortable, like a Hog EQ, we are uh, seeing him able to capitalize and play super well here. Yeah, if we get into a game three, I wouldn't mind seeing him just run kind of a basic deck, one that allows him to just kind of know how the matchup is supposed to be played, whether it be uh, Rascal's Graveyard or potentially Drill or just something that he's used to. So that way he's just in full confidence. I mean, game number three, a full confident Moogie, it, it's just hard to stop. So I wouldn't mind seeing that if we get to game number three, 45 seconds left. It, it's just this game, there's not really a whole lot to talk about at this point. He, he's just defending so well, and it, it it feels unrealistic for Lord Seb to get past. But Double Giant Skeleton, that's going to be one of those ways. Double Giant Skelly does a good job. Great block from Moogie. The bridge, though, making the hog go in front. Must here and absolutely, absolutely obliterate here. I think that's the other part of this matchup we didn't really touch on. The glass cannons in matches like this are super important because the Earthquake doesn't get any value versus a Musketeer or an Archer Queen. But the thing is, an Archer Queen's a champ, and that three card cycle is useful, but you can only have one of her on the board. Meanwhile, you can see Moogie stacking these Musketeers, controlling the match. The last second is gonna tick off the timer, and that is gonna be GG's. Moogie gonna take game two, force it to a game three. I, I don't know, like who do you got for this game three? Oh, <laughs> Not to put you, you know, on the spot, but. Yeah, no, no, yeah. No, I mean, it is, it is. Uh, 
game number three i i thought it was a great game from game number two but actually what you said uh, i i hadn't really thought about where uh you can only get one archer queen on the board so mm -hmm. You know, those musketeers were becoming so powerful, and we see Lord Seb just kind of groan. He sees the Mother Witch, and, uh, okay, I'm gonna... I, that's the reason why I was talking for so long. I'm gonna say Mookie <laughs> now that I've seen Lord Seb's reaction. Yeah, I mean, Mother Witch, like I talked about in that, in that game, I think it was Pedro, um, where he just absolutely annihilated his opponent um, using this deck without a big spell in hand. Mugi going to have the Mother Witch. Sometimes you don't need a counter to the Goblin, like a Poison or an EQ, if you have the Mother Witch, because the Mother Witch does a great job of spawning those Spear Gobs into Piggies and taking it out. Not only that, but it's also the best counter in the game to Graveyard. And that's something that Lord Seb's going to have to work around there as well. So the last cards are going to be probably, you know, just Bar Barrel and Tombstone. And so Lord Seb is certainly going to have to figure out how he wants to poison. Those tombstones can become a problem if you're not using your poison on top of them. Uh, so just kind of how he wants to approach the tombstone and Mother Witch uh, duo together is going to dictate how this game is. And on the other side, Mookie just, he has to control this Goblin Hut, right? Like th that's the way you want to win this matchup if you're Mookie. Yeah. And he's doing a great job of that so far with the fireball and the and the mother witch. Something that you mentioned um, about the small spell from Mugi, you said that bar barrel. And you're right, he does have bar barrel. And I think that also plays a huge difference in this match though. Because as long as Lord Seb can play low rascals, that bar barrel not able to reach them. So it kind of changes a lot about this matchup. Might be able to see some sort of breakthrough or or some sort of breakthrough for Lord Seb defensively anyways using the rascals low in order to maybe defend and counter push and so right here this is exactly what I wanted to see I, I I was too afraid to speak up because I wasn't sure if that's how you're supposed to play the matchup but he plays the tombstone low just so that way he can play the mother witch high and it both will be able to take out the graveyards and so like right now, when you have a tombstone in the back, you can't play graveyard. And th that's just so detrimental to the success of the deck where you, you just want to play it, but you know you can't. But at the same time, it just allows him to set up for Goblin Hut. So, you know, both players kind of playing it exactly how you're supposed to. Mugi wants to set up tombstones and Lord Seb wants to, it, it, it's a building meta. And uh, just place your buildings down whenever you can, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Poison gonna come out from Lord Seb here. That's gonna make a huge difference here. Poison gonna be super helpful versus the, you know, the Mother Witch, the Zappies, even the Tombstone, like you said. Mother Witch is back in cycle, though. The Zappies, they're doing a great job, and the Poison's not in cycle. This is a huge mistake from Lord Seb to go for this Graveyard when he doesn't have his main spell to go with it. At this point, Moogie's gonna be ha having a huge counter push. Here comes the RG. Skeleton ability does pop before wow. it dies. And maybe we'll get a fireball out into, onto these rascals. No, that would be an overcommitment. I really like the fish boy here to take out and start working on this counter push before it happens. Yeah, Moogie's playing this really well. And I mean, you just can't, it's it's something you're taught on uh, day number one of graveyard school where like you just, you can't go in when you don't have a yeah. response to a mother witch. It, it, it's, it's what you're taught, and it, it's surprising to see those mistakes at this level. And, you know, but it, at the same time, it's just, it's hard to have that concentration for the full five minutes. And, and that's just what it comes down to. Some players, especially if they're new, aren't going to be able to focus for that long in a game. Here comes a very valuable poison. Skeleton ability gonna pop as well. Fishman pretty distracted. Rascals at the bridge, that's gonna be some fireball value. Double Phoenix though, the flock is coming in. Bar Barrel gets some value. Goblins at the bridge, Skeleton at the bridge. Boogie's just trying to control this and he's doing just that. Here comes the Graveyard, but like you said, the Tombstone's there. He's got another Mother Witch in cycle. Skeleton Boogie is not getting that much value. Poison does get solid value hitting five Zappies and the Mother Witch, <laughs> but it's not enough to break through. Moogie's defense is just so solid here. Yeah. I, I, like, that was a fantastic poison, though. And right there, 10 seconds left. It, it's just not going to be enough. He, he's stacking the Mother Witch. He, he's applauding his opponent. You you love to see, you know, you can be as competitive as you want. You can 
technically say whatever you want before the match, but you gotta <laughs> give props to your opponent. And uh, that was just a, a a great way to save the set on Moogie's end. Game number one was kind of terrifying as a Moogie believer, but games two and games three, he cleaned everything up. Fantastic way to end that set on Moogie's end. Yeah, fantastic deck picks as well, which really helped him out through there with game two and game three. And uh, the gameplay, just immaculate. I think he I think he finally woke up and realized, all right, it's time to win some games. And that's what he did. Yeah, and so it's, it's so funny that you brought it up earlier where I was, we were talking about the Rascal's Graveyard and how you felt about it in the meta. And you were like, ah, eh, you know, matchups, blah, blah, blah. And right here, I mean, it, it's just so strong or it's so weak right there it, it was just one of those matchups where it was so weak he couldn't do anything the tombstone plus the mother witch it, it's i love the deck overall but do you think that you should maybe avoid using that because everybody's prepped for it what, what do you think what are your thoughts on it the other thing to mention is just the fact that hog eq is currently the most used deck in crl and how well Hoggy Q does versus that deck. So it's just it's just a matter of the matchups, I think, like you said. Um, I think it really just depends on what cards your opponent has. Maybe if they use the poison, they use the earthquake, like we saw in that uh, in that Pedro match. You can get a crazy good matchup, and the goblin is just so oppressive, there's nothing you can do. But um, as we saw in game three here, or I guess this, yeah, this is gonna be game two for this replay, for game three, like, sorry. Game three for the replay, like, you know. You're pulling a rich. He has the fireball. <laughs> he has the mother witch for the Goblin and uh, he did a great job of just controlling the match as well. Yeah, uh, I loved what I saw. And Lord Seb, I mean, I, I I think he probably gained a lot of fans today. And I, I it, it's weird looking at someone go 0-2 overall and say like, wow, they did, a pretty solid job, but yeah, you went one and two against Mo and then one and two against Moogie. That's nothing to scoff at whatsoever. I think he I I think he's leaving this weekend with with two thoughts. One is, wow, I, I, I can do this, I can compete. And two, why in the world did I get matched up against Mo round one and Moogie yeah, round that's two? Tough. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So game one here, you know, we talked about it. The monk was the biggest thing. Moogie misplayed every single monk ability. Magic Archer always survived. Game two, you know, we saw a bunch of different stuff happen. A Hoggy Q mirror matchup. I talked about it already. Mighty Miner, super strong in the mirror match here, especially because of the fact that you open up the, the non-champ spot, believe it or not, for the Musketeer. You'll get so much value versus those. Game three, you know, go ahead and take it. Let me know if there's anything that kind of like stood out to you here. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything that we didn't really touch on. Yeah. And I mean, not really. Uh, Lord said, but I mean, you talked about it with the bar barrel not being able to take out the rascals if they played low, but then he already had too much damage. And even when he was able to stack, he just got way too much value on the fireballs when everything was crossing the bridge. So it was just so difficult for him to set up that one true push. Well, Josh, you know, you, you, you talked about, you said one thing there that was phenomenal during that matchup. Day number one of Graveyard School. The, uh, and I, of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know which school you went to, but playing into the Mother Witch with no answer for the Mother Witch, it, it did feel like there were just some decision-making challenges on Seb's part that, that led to what could have been a, a close win or even maybe a, a fairly strong win versus the result that we saw. Yeah, I, I, I still, I still want to give credit because you know it's it's hard to remain focused. It's hard to remain uh, just locked in for that that fifteen minute period where you're going into game number three. You have to play perfectly. You're going against Moogie. So I, I, at the end of the day, it, it's tough seeing him go out that way where he didn't play flawlessly at the end. But at the same time, it, it's just there's so much confidence coming from him. I'm really excited to see in, in the next two months, I would not be shocked if he makes another appearance or at least several top 32s. That, that's certainly feasible for his talent level. Well, of course, that's in the future. Let's look at what we just saw right now. And here we are. We have now finally gone down from eight to seven. Lord Sebastian losing to Mugi, who will move on in our lower elimination bracket.
we will be seeing that as our first match tomorrow. For those of you who uh, want to figure out how this thing ends, well, we are, of course, back here tomorrow, but more gameplay remaining today in day number one. Coming up next, Hugo and Faust in an elimination matchup. And this one, I think, uh, I don't know if we all picked across the board here, but I believe everyone was picking Hugo are picking Faust in this matchup. Uh, if I got that wrong from one of you two, please go ahead and correct me, but it does feel like we saw good gameplay from Faust in his last match, and uh, this one should be, from his side, a bounce back effort, but Hugo certainly dangerous here. Juicy, are you taking Faust on this one? Yeah, I am taking Faust. You know, it kind of goes back to what I was saying in game one um, for his match one. I think that he could have won that match. He just kind of slipped a little bit, and especially the deck picks, but, you know, as we head into this one, I think that, you know, I have confidence in him to take it, but, you know, I'm not going to take anything away from Hugo either. Like, he's definitely a player. It's definitely an even matchup. He's a player that has a good chance to win this. Um, oh, crap. What do you got? Like, do you think that, <laughs> did he pick Faust or did he pick Hugo? So, I, I, I've just been listening to you trying to figure out who I chose. I, I think I chose... <laughs> Hugo, but I I could have chosen Faust. My official answer though right now is I'm taking Hugo. Uh Faust at, at the end of the day, I is it's weird he you know he can think whatever he wants, but for me personally, he has to impress me at this point. Otherwise, yeah. I have to choose his opponent. He's now 0 and 3 in top 8 sets and that that just can't happen. So I I I want to see something special from him in this set. Well, Confirmed Josh did pick Hugo. We'll give him some time off here to maybe think about his next picks or at least practice remembering them for the future as Juicy and I jump in to our second lower bracket quarterfinal here. And oh, look at that. It's a goblin hunt, Juicy. Another goblin hunt, graveyard appearance. It's not really a surprise. Faust with a monk roll giant. You know, it's a pretty solid matchup already for Hugo, just based off of Faust's deck here. The Monk will get a little bit of value, but Phoenix, one of the best counters to it, as well as he's not having a very good spell to deal with the Goblins either. Most likely, he's going to be using a Lightning, maybe a Fireball. Either way, Goblin's going to get value. We have primarily seen this run with Fireball as of late, in especially in these dual mode sets, but... We'll see if Faust takes a slightly different track in this one. Nice monk reflection there to deal with some goblins and get back on the tower. Hunter doing some cleanup, cleanup work, but Faust will have to contend with the final pop of this hunt. Yep, it's going to be that last spawn and a, another death spawn as well. Arrow is going to be a little sneaky attack here onto the fisher boy gonna get one or two goblin hits before that barbell is forced down here comes the already the right from house mascals on the defense and he doesn't have much for it i think this is a huge mistake i think he thought he was up more elixir than he actually was already does get two shots but this counter but is huge rascals plus phoenix hunter gonna work behind this monk and here we go graveyard push opposite lane Fishboy was distracted, but the Skeleton King wanders to the middle and does end up getting pulled either way. That is a ton of GY damage, so Faust punished for not recognizing what the actual elixir balance was. Yeah, I couldn't have said it my, my better myself, Hugo, actually realizing how much the elixir deferential was after that poor play from Faust, capitalizing quite well. Meanwhile, the Spear Gobs is Goblin Hut. Shot, like constant chip damage. You know, we talk about the Elixir Pump a lot and its ability to uh, be an investment for future Elixir, but the Goblin Hut is kind of the other side of that coin. It's an investment for damage throughout the match, and there's not really another card that does it like the Goblin Hut does right now. Final two minutes lead significantly in Hugo's favor. Juicy, what's the game plan for Faust going forward to, to break through and try to take this one back? You know, I think he's doing a pretty good job of it right now. You got to go ops lane. Never want to go same lane against a graveyard player. Got to get the monk in front of the RG. Hugo with the Rascal's graveyard ops the lane, though, making it so it's difficult to attack and defend at the same time. The Spirit does get some value. These skeletons are swarming, and the defense on the right for Hugo is immaculate. 662 left-hand lane, 80 seconds left. 
and nothing. No footing, no handholds on a cliff with no rope right now is Faust. Remember, this is an elimination set, folks, so losing game one here puts your back to the wall. Yeah, and I think that's just kind of like what's going to happen here. I mean, the poison's dropping down. He's just two poison arrows away. There's triple elixir. Skelly King Graveheart at the bridge. Faust, he does have the E-Spirit. He does have a barbell for the Graveheart, but that's about it. Three arrows. Tries to drop in the E-Spirit. Doesn't come down in time. And uh, good defense, but like I said, one more poison. There it goes. Good defense. Too late. GG well played. And now we're one game away from Josh looking like a genius here. <laughs> I did not think about that. I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, game one down. I mean, reminder, guys, is duels format best of threes. None of these cards in the first game can be repeated. I might be able to influence how this match goes forward and uh, what these players pick as we head into game two. We're 10 seconds in. We're both at 10 elixir. Looks like both players waiting for the other to make the first move. And nice slow opening here from both of these guys. You know what we have not seen? I don't think you've seen it today at all, unless there was a, it was played during the time I was off screen. I don't think it was, though. We have not seen mirrored pigs this weekend. I think we saw it once, but I think Moogie played it once in game one versus in his round one match and lost versus Electra Giants, if I remember that correctly, but um, We've yeah, not we seen much seen, of it. Yeah, we haven't seen much at all, and and it hasn't performed either. You go Mother Witch right into a poison. Yep. Poison gonna drop. Looking at the matchup here, I mean, you got Mighty Minor Minor Wall Breakers versus some Zappies, Roll Giants, and a Fisherman. A lot of counters to that pesky Mighty Minor. Not a lot of counters to the guards, though. Barbell does a decent job. Monk here instead of the Skeleton King. That's interesting. I think that's going to help him out a lot as the deflections come through for the Musketeers. And again, this weekend, it's really been the Skeleton King version. People have been leaving yeah. on as opposed to the monk version of RG, but here we go. RG at the bridge. And Faust is pretty low on elixir there just because that one good monk ability clean up the musket. Guards do have a high DPS, but RG gets two shots. Wallbreakers at the bridge. I think the tombstone should be able to clean this up pretty nicely though. Hugo 8.8k personal best on Legacy Ladder, and of course, some nice high finishes in old ladder and ranked but has never really cracked the the top echelons those top 10 spots still you make top 100 that's fairly solid overall definitely poison gonna drop in the zabbies fish boy point in this mother is gonna get some value minor wall breakers here with a log meanwhile this monk on the right hand side is looking dangerous card is gonna drop for it and the wall breakers so much damage and you're talking about Hugo here. The uh, This is a guy who's been just outside of CRL World Finals so many times. 2021 finished 35th. And of course, top 32 made World Finals. 2022 finished 22nd. Top 16 made World Finals. So he would, of course, love to break that pattern. If he finishes, you know, 17th this year, that would be an absolute devastation. And right now, hoping to keep those dreams alive. Absolutely. I think you have a bit of a mistake here from Hugo. Instead of going for Monk in front of his RG, he decided to drop a Fireball instead. That Monk could have got so much value deflecting the must here and the Bomb Tower potentially. And there's 40 seconds left. Here comes the Monk RG now, but the Minor Wall Breaks in the opposite lane could be brutal. And the Monk ability. Like, it was just a beautiful play from Faust there. Pressure in the opposite lane, distracting him for just a second, and the Monk ability's late. Minor into the back, 90 seconds, a little under 90 seconds left. Fireball has to come out against those wall breakers, not what Hugo wanted to do. And now he has to eat a bunch of damage from that Musketeer. That's not the lane he's trying to win, but that does, of course, open up opportunities for Faust. Mighty Minor in the back here, going to try and deal with this Royal Giants. Monk in front, I'm sure Zappies or Fishman will be used for that. Love the play for Faust to just continually apply pressure in the opposite lane. 
make these RG pushes more difficult to deal with. And this RG does finally turn towards that bomb tower. It seemed like it might be on a path to connect. Ended up not doing it. Log chip going to extend the lead for Faust, who now poisons to get rid of the support behind the Royal Giant. 35 seconds left. Big damage for Faust in both lanes. Game three looking like a reality, but here comes the double RG push, Monk in front. Double RG, all same lane. Bomb Tower's a little bit distracted. Really good poison value, but there's a Fish Boy, Zappies, two Mother Witches, and one of these RGs is gonna connect for one shot, and second Bomb Tower is gonna drop, but here comes a third one. I don't think I've ever seen three Royal Giants all in the same lane at once, and I know wow. Faust did not want to see it. Oh Hugo, God. two O's Faust, and stays alive in Clash Royale League. I don't even know what to say after that. I was like, okay, two RGs. Will the bomb tower be able to take this out? The Zappy distracted left inside. A poison did a decent job, but I think the poison was a little bit misplaced from Faust. He had to play up one more tile in order to reach those Mother Witches, those Zappies. And that's what kind of propelled that third RG forward, getting in front of all of those supporting units. It was actually, I don't know. Have you ever seen three RGs dropped in concession like that in Cyril? That was wild. No, that was really crazy. I'm just trying to like think of, I want to see the replays there and figure out how do you cycle? I know it's triple elixir. I know that we have three card cycle with champions, but how with how thick that deck is, do you cycle to three Royal Giants to get them all in the same lane at the same time? I know they were there for a flash, but they were still there. That was, I mean, that in and of itself is uh, kind of shocking and impressive. Let's go ahead, though, and take a look at the beginning of this matchup between Hugo and Faust. And this was the Goblin Hut Graveyard against this RG deck. Yeah, we talked a little bit here, but, you know, Hugo did a great job just punishing his opponent earlier on. Goblin's got so much value. Poisons did as well in game two. You know, it was more about, um, it was a little bit closer, but those uh, RGs throughout the match always popping away. You know, Faust tried to apply pressure, but there, here's the moment we were looking at. You know, just triple RG on the board just for a second, slaughtering this tower, no mercy. And let's take a look at maybe the most important part of the replay here. <laughs> Josh cannot believe it. How did Faust not get the dub there? Seemed like he had it all locked up, and then Hugo goes one, two, three RGs, skipping all the way to the tower, and keeps himself in the hunt here. Faust going out early for the second time in monthly finals this year. Yep. Certainly has lots of points, certainly keeps himself in the mix on the leaderboard. Currently in that range overall on points to get a birth to world finals but man definitely one of those ones where you want to go back to the drawing board and figure out how do you get past these first couple of matches here in our monthlies so game one you know we talked about it i'm gonna say it again i think that faust needs a mother witch incorporated into this rg deck especially with how popular these graveyard decks are right now i think that could have definitely helped him out a lot let me know what you think about the game too it was the final match we talked about it a little bit this was fascinating, right? I mean, you think about this, we we saw some gameplay earlier today where the defender with this bomb tower is able to get back to it over and over and over again. But you talk about this deck being a little bit slower with the guards variation and just yeah. not quite able to get back to it as quickly. And when you saw those RGs stack at the end, just GG well played. And again, I'm gonna go back and watch this one later in full just to figure out how the heck that happened. You know, it's tough to say. The Monk RG, you know, the three card cycle definitely helped out a bit. I think the other big thing we didn't really mention was the fact that the Monk is able to deflect the Musketeer shots. You know, a lot of the time, a Musketeer gets a lot of value in matchup like that because the Fireball plus Barbaro usually can't reach the Musketeer on the defense. But the Monk deflecting that kept the first two RGs long, alive long enough for the third RG to come down. Josh, we saw your reaction when you were not on the cast here, talk to us about that ending. Well, it comes down to this. This is the number of RGs he got on the board. And if you look at it closely, it also shows a W. And uh, 
you, you, you throw three RGs on the, the board, it's going to be difficult to stop. That, that was a phenomenal way to end that match. I, I could not believe it. I mean, it's so heavy. I, I don't care about the three-card cycle. You're not supposed to ever be able to get three RGs on the board. What a way to just claw your way back into it. One of the RGs had one HP, and everything was targeting the other one, so that way both of them took out the bomb tower at the same time. I, just, just incredible gameplay. Ah, oh, feels good looking like a genius. <laughs> well, speaking of genius, then there were six. Let's take a look at our bracket now. Moogie and Hugo both staying alive. We say goodbye to Lord Seb and Faust here on day number one. And now Moogie and Hugo done for the day, get to sit back, relax, and find out who they will be facing in that lower bracket next round. And coming up next, we have some absolute absolute bangers and maybe the match i am most excited about on the day uh we'll see if i can right the ship here i was killing it on predictions and then lord seb and faust both leaving me hanging josh now you're uh, in the lead with two very nice picks and we're gonna go into our final two uh i can't beat you at this point i can't even tie you at this point we're have the same picks but as we go into match seven you and i both picking adriel and juicy J. Going with Mohammed Light. Now, Juicy, I think this is the question everyone wants to know. Why in the world would you pick Mohammed Light? Yeah, I mean, I always say it's really hard to pick against, or pick against him. Uh, I do, Like I said, I do think Audriel will win this golden ticket. But beating Mohammed Light maybe happens now. But Mohammed Light is going to go to the lose bracket. And he's going to take his revenge later. Um... But I think the, the higher chance is that Muhammad Light is going to knock Audriel to the loser bracket, and we're going to see them meet up again later. Well, one of the interesting factors here, Josh, we talked about this earlier, is that both these guys are working with Jebba's, with the same analyst. And of course, Jebba's not going to pick a side in this one, going to go ahead and sit, sit out. And now we're going to see the deck picking ability between these two. And you know, now that I'm thinking about the pick here for a second, we know that Mohammed Light is a brilliant deck picker in his own right. We don't really have that information about Adriel. Yeah, that's right. That's going to be something that you are going to have to watch out for. Is he going to go meta? Is he going to go off meta? Do Does he have decks that he's prepared on the side just for this specific matchup? If there's one player in the game that you create decks for, just knowing you're going to have to go up against him in the bracket eventually, it's going to be Muhammad Light. And so this actually really benefits him that neither of the players have an analyst. Yes, Muhammad Light is so talented at picking decks, but we could see some surprise decks from Adriel just knowing knowing that neither player has the analyst. It's all up to themselves to find that right deck. Well, we've talked a lot about the ability to be unpredictable, but that also requires a, a wide range of flexibility. I guess that's maybe... The big question here is, does Adriel have the flexibility, have the depth to go ahead and be able to play? We saw here today with Lord Seb, right? Trying to go outside of his comfort zone and doing it quite intelligently, but maybe there just wasn't quite the depth of experience with something like that graveyard deck to make those correct choices. So I think that's the big question to answer here for Adriel. Uh, Juicy, keys to victory here for, for the young man as he goes up against Mr. Clash Royale. You know, I see Audrey talking to someone and, you know, I think the biggest thing is like maybe Jebus is standing out, but there are other analysts for both of these players. I think that it's going to come down to the deck picks. Same thing of what happened against Moogie. Audrey taking him out just by having some solid picks and playing well to back that up. So here we go. Josh and I will take it away here for this upper bracket semifinal. Adriel versus Mohamed Light. Adriel gonna go in with the high mother witch just starting off a little bit aggressive monk is going to be able to cross the bridge but not going to get that much value the giant skeleton plus the fisherman plus everything going to be able to take out the mother witch and this is going to be kind of a scary push that is a lot of elixir on Adriel's side that is just wasted and you were waiting for it I mean yes Moogie used it a little bit but it wasn't with you so it doesn't really count uh and so now we're seeing the royal hawks get played on the board for the first time today technically second time i'll t i'll take i'll take the l on that one but but not taking the l here is adriel 
who somehow not only defends all that, keeps the giant skeleton bomb off the board, and ends up only down about half an elixir. And so I love this no fireball and cycle. It, it's gonna that's gonna be a lot of damage. It, it, the difference it, it it it's not like I mean yes it's a massive difference just between the levels being level 11 and level 12. But if there's one card that just does so much more damage, so much better of a card when it's mirrored, it's those royal hogs. They get get this it gets the tower down to 1661. And here we go, fireball for the zappies. The fisherman maybe kind of playing spoiler here as it pulls the zappy in closer. Lead now back for Adriel. Right now, it's just body blow after body blow for these two. And the lead now has changed back and forth multiple times. Looks like the lead might go heavily in the favor of Mohammed Light here as just not very much to contend with this tower down. And Adriel leaving a lot on the board here. Yeah, I think that might be considered a mistake on Andrea's side. You have 50 seconds left. You still have the opportunity to get multiple RGs on the board. You can reset, but you know your opponent is taking out the tower. You don't need to log plus E Spirit when a tower is already going down. So kind of a kind of just a massive error. And now he just doesn't have enough time. It, it was going to be kind of easy for Muhammad Light to defend regardless, but it just made it easier when he wasted that three elixir. So game number one goes the way of Mohammed Light. Adriel has a lot to think about here as we go into game number two. Not really worried about the Luminary Minor MK Prince deck, although there could be a variation play that's non-Arrows on Adriel's side. Hog available, yeah. but of course, log preferable there. And right there, he's using the RG without the tombstone. And so if he had the tombstone, that deck could have or that matchup could have been flipped entirely. He just sets up with multiple tombstones, gets the fireball. But even still, you know, even without the building, if he just plays a little bit slower, there's a Muhammad Light's so gifted because he's played every matchup a hundred times, and it, there's something about the way his, his brain is wired where he just memorizes the matchup. It was pretty clear that the way he played it, he knew what he was supposed to do. He can give up early damage, he can give up medium damage, just because he knows those kind of attacks are going to be so deadly and so hard to stop. Drill versus Hog. So we're seeing the rare situation where Adriel doesn't run a hog deck and obviously not having log available for your hog deck definitely hurts it a lot but rare situation for adriel who primarily plays hog on ladder and has run it in almost every dual deck set throughout this competition gonna get some nice damage though from the royal ghost on the right hand side yeah both players getting about 500 chip damage on top of the towers we have hog quick cycle archer queen earthquake going against drill no big spell so this drill deck, it's probably just going to be Giant Skeleton. It could be a Dark Prince as well. And uh, yeah, we do see the Cannon Cart. So still kind of looking like both of those could be played. Is the Tornado in Cycle? For a second, I thought he missed that Tornado. It was a little bit early, but it's going to be A-OK. -okay. Still defending and both players kind of just resetting. Kind of just waiting for Double Elixir. Neither player really wants to get that aggressive right now. Very important for Adriel to manage this cycle well because he does get around a lot more slowly than Mohammed Light. And of course, Nato, the primary counter. And Mo got to be very happy that he's playing the Valk variation in this matchup. And, and so right there, right before double elixir, he can get kind of aggressive because you have that double elixir incoming. I, I love that he went in with the drill, and I was wondering why he went in the drill with no counterattack, just because it didn't make sense. Your opponent had guards, he had Valk, so, but if you're going to go in with a magic archer chip damage, I just love how he uh, approached that situation. And this time drill plus Ewiz comes out on defense, so a little variety out of Adriel forced in this situation to make that happen. Cannon card goes to the right-hand side, taken care of very easily by the guards. 22-12 to 21-10, and now it's Muhammad Light going into that right-hand lane and switching up this conversation. GG, well played. Another good tornado, and this is where it gets really fun. 
with or going into uh it going into overtime his king tower is just as low as his crown tower and so this has happened before where players have to stop tornadoing the hog to the king tower where they have to switch it up i've, I've seen this i think it was pandora who had this situation uh you know several months ago and it, it is so funny when players no longer uh, tornado the hog to the king tower because that's just not an opportunity anymore 1572 a little crack in the armor here for Adriel and Muhammad light now starting to pull away and Adriel being forced to stack a bit more in this left-hand lane troops wise no longer the same ability to go to the left and you do see here NATOing back and the Ewiz has to come out yeah, if the Ewiz is forced out, I don't think you can make that play. I think he probably should have had that lock onto the King Tower right there. Magic Archer not placed too high, and he's going to be able to protect it, but no Ewiz in cycle, and so the Magic Archer is going to be able to be taken out by the Inferno Tower. And again, just more hog pressure, another hog on top of the King Tower, and Ice Spirit chip damage. Muhammad Light is just dominating in this game, and he's playing it so well. Lane switch into the weak side from Adriel. Valkyrie going to work here. Nice log from Mohammed Light to reset that art that magic archer plus the earthquake. So no magic archer damage. The log plus EQ takes it off the board. And that was just some of the you know, you talk about the, the genius of Mohammed Light. That was some of the small genius that we see from him. Wow. Oh. Wow. Oh, Inferno boy. Tower takes out the Golden Knight entirely. That is I have not seen that possibly ever. That is devastating for Adriel. And at this point, he was plus Golden Knight. Yes, you're going to be able to stop the Hog from getting the shot. But yes, it doesn't matter. What a flawless game. That might be the best game I've seen from him uh, in a long time. And <laughs> we see special games from him every single day. And Although, there's a low. Oh my wow. word, that was so close. <laughs> wow. The, the nice high guards to control the Golden Knight. The NATO does not create a lineup, but the the Ewiz plus the pop from the drill nearly <laughs> takes it, and Mo just goes, oh, well, I guess I need a little snack as I now go ahead and take the end of my day one and get ready for day two in the winner's bracket still. He, he, he's reacting very well to... <laughs> almost giving up that game just you know ah, it's okay i still won so might as well just grab a, a bite to eat i deserve it but that that could have been dangerous not i we were more worried than he was clearly i mean thin margins all the way around from mohammed light today and let's go back to game number one where they really it seemed like this was just a, a rough situation for adriel you know the you're you're playing against you know you don't here's the thing is you also don't know for sure you're up against mirrored bigs right because you could be playing against the mother witch variation um post from the crl esports account was saying that the the pigs giant skeleton this exact deck with seven cards was played over 800 times the most played variation in the swiss and group stages but it was either the, the Mother Witch or the Mirror. So you, you have to respect that first set of Royal Hogs. Yeah, you have to figure it out, but either way, good damage the other direction. And then this was the Golden Knight who just protected the Magic Archer, maybe anticipating something different, but wasn't able to stay alive and got absolutely burnt down. Here is that ending. And those goblins were just a half second. That was a timing thing. If again, we've talked about it twice today, if there was 0.3 seconds remaining in a game, Mohammed Light would have lost the first set of the day and would have lost this game, but the timing just works out perfectly, and Mo now undefeated in the winner's bracket. Well, and, and the craziest thing is, with Mohammed Light, you just, you don't think it's luck. At the end of the day, yes, the tower, you know, there was only a 200 HP discrepancy between the two players, but I feel like he just knew, oh, you know, I have 1.2 seconds left in the game. I can just log and it takes 1.3 seconds for the goblins to hatch from uh, the drill and then be able to stab onto the tower. So it's just anybody else. They make that play. It's oh, wow. That's so fortunate for him. But when he makes it, it's in the back of my mind. I know he knows the interaction.
I don't know if we can go backwards on decks here, but I just realized the ridiculous thing that I missed in game number one. And yes, we can. Thank you. I was talking about, is it the mirror or the mother witch? And the fireball, I believe, came out. I can't remember if it was on the zappies, but it's both for Muhammad Light. Played the no champion variation here. And so it was both mirror and mother witch. And I don't remember from the replay if the mother witch came out beforehand. But if that was the case, Muhammad Light baited the trap perfectly. Hey, you, you've already played, uh, you're not worried about the mirrored pigs because you've seen Mother Witch and then boom, level 12 pigs come out. So we can continue along from this point forward, but uh, I'm saying, is it this or that? And Mo's saying neither, it's something else entirely. Game number two, uh, and this was the this was a, a very difficult one for Adriel. The hoggy Q work from Mohammed Light, perfect. And yeah, the overtime, just how do you, how do you defend those hogs? Very, very difficult for Adriel Mohamed Light. Does a great job once more. Yeah, and I I think one of the main things, you, you just can't place a Golden Knight. Crazy enough, you you can't place a Golden Knight into an Inferno Tower's range and then also use a dash as well for it to not even cross the bridge entirely. That that's just so massive. Yeah, it was that was pretty rough. Juicy. Mohamed Light does Mohamed Light things. Talk to us about it. Yeah, I mean, he played very well. The decks were solid. I think the biggest thing that we didn't really talk about was in that game one. Um, I think it was an overcommit by Ardriel with his file if you, fireball, if you remember. When that RG counter push happened, it was definitely the right moment to counter push. But the fisherman was already locked onto one of the zappies. And, you know, he had a good push going. He didn't have to use that fireball. That's what really lost mm -hmm. in the game. You know, he went for the Monk on defense versus the Giant Scully, but he was out of Elixir at that point, and the Piggies just destroyed his tower. He could have saved that Fireball. He would have had no problems, and he definitely would have had chances to win that one. Well, he did not, and now that does give us a good picture of what our bracket will look like moving forward as Adriel will face Hugo in our lower bracket tomorrow, and Mugi awaits the loser of our next matchup. And... You know, this is one of those real, real interesting questions, right? If you're in the lower bracket, you kind of want Mohamed Light to keep winning from this point, right? If you're Mugi, Adriel, or Hugo, you are hoping that Mo Light wins his match tomorrow and just, hey, go get into the finals so that I have a guaranteed golden ticket at this point. Um, and of course, either Pedro or Sosa would love to ruin that story for those there at the bottom. And that's our next matchup here, Pedro versus Sosa. And guys, Let's talk about this one. Who are you going with? Sosa's had kind of a hot hand today, but Pedro feels like maybe he is finally turning the corner and has a chance to really step up into the role that we've been expecting from him. Josh, is this Pedro's match or does Sosa have it? Sosa has really impressed me, but it's, it's Pedro's match. All right. He has played so well. He knows so many different decks. He's so talented with a couple, you know, the hog and the mortar. And so you have to watch out for those two decks. All your deck, your entire deck pool gets limited because of that. And it, it, it's just that match between, you know, what deck is he going to use? And he's just too talented. I, I, I think it, uh, I think it has to go Pedro's way. Juicy, same question to you. Sosa has looked very good today. Does that continue here against Pedro? And let's keep this in mind for a second that overall, Sosa has the matchup lead between these two, having beaten Pedro twice uh, so far in CRL. You know, I bet against him in his first game, or his first game and uh, I was completely wrong. I am betting against him again, but <laughs> who knows? Maybe it's a reverse caster's curse where whoever, I, whoever I'm betting against, he's just going to take the W here. We do have a Hog EQ at the bottom from Sosa and a Pedro going back to his comfort with the minor poison. Overall, just looking at the matchup, I'd say Pedro has a pretty solid advantage so far. Yeah, the Musketeer plus the Mighty Miner, it's going to provide a lot of value on defense. And... He should have... Is this the variation without wall breakers? I, I, I can't tell if it's going to be the Ice Spirit. Okay, it is going to be the wall breakers variation. So, it's... 
he, he's not going to be able to pair the Mighty Miner with the Ice Spirit, but this Wall Breaker chip throughout the game, it's just going to it's going to force out three Elixir every time. It's either going to force out the Guards or the Ice Spirit plus Log and the Miner chip as well with Pedro just being so aggressive, but also always managing his Elixir. Pedro definitely should have the advantage in this matchup. Yeah, I mean, you made some good points. Those Wall Breakers... Or two elixir always applying so much pressure which can be mentally exhausting as a player throughout the entirety of a match but also very elixir exhausting it's very difficult to get a positive elixir trade versus those wall breakers so oh yes i was waiting for that yeah he is able to get the miner in the middle that way the right crown tower was able to target the Miner instead of the wall breaker. I, or I, I just love those plays. I, I was going to comment on it, but I didn't earlier. This is the second time I've done this today where I want to say something and then I, I, I just forget. I, I'm, I'm going to work on that. Yeah, I mean, whenever I'm teaching people how to play Clash Royale, that's the one spot I say never place your miner. Both Prince's Towers can attack. In this situation, Pedro is using that to his advantage, distracting both sides and allowing that right hand side wall breaker to connect. So really nice split guards, kind of a prediction because he knows that his opponent wants to go in with the wall breakers to try and get a little bit aggressive. The Archer Queen will be activated, but it's not gonna do anything. The poison plus log is going to clean that up nicely. Hog in the back, it's so funny. Uh, when I'm coaching my players, I tell them, hey, <laughs> never put the hog in the back. <laughs> and then we see all these players that make this play. So sometimes uh, you have to realize there's situations for everything. Yeah, and if you guys back home are wondering why the heck did Pedro, or why the heck did Sosa do that, the biggest reason to put a hog in the back is basically you can do that in order to try and attempt to outcycle your opponent. You go for a hog in the back, there's two options that Pedro has. You can either play that bomb tower right away, which is a free pickings for earthquake value, or you can wait to play the bomb tower later. But if you do that, at that point, Sosa is going to be playing multiple other cards and getting the next hog right back and cycle a little bit quicker. It's right there. That was a great play from Sosa. He gets aggressive with the guards at the bridge to help the giant skeleton push itself into a situation where Pedro needs to bomb tower. He bomb towers to defend the giant skeleton. The hog opposite lane gets the tower down to 2250. That's just great recognition on Sosa's end. He has to get aggressive. Otherwise, the game is just going to fall apart for him. Yeah. So again, going in right lane to just kind of block everything and left lane to go in with the hogs. I'd like to see Earthquakes paired with that. And now that it's triple elixir, it should be very easy for him to do that. I think you're absolutely right. You know, based on how good of a matchup, I'd say this is for Pedro. So this is playing this fantastically. He's actually in, or he's actually, he's not in the damage lead, but he's very close. Very good pickup on the guards here on the minor. He, like you said, I think he's not cycling enough earthquakes. At this point, like you need to play more earthquakes than hog in order to try and get some damage in. And I love this from Pedro going to block the giant skeleton at yeah. the bridge so that way he can uh, set up his defenses a little bit nicer. And this just puts Sosa in such an awkward spot because he wants to go in with the hog, but he can't because of the bomb tower already being up. And he's gonna swap lanes this late, go in for the left side, forget the right side, forget the tower that he was going into the entire time. And bomb tower plus goblins, is this going to be enough? Five seconds left, I don't think it's going to be enough on Sosa's end, it's not. Pedro walking away with game number one and just phenomenal defense plus offense plus aggression plus cute little minor plays. Yeah, and you made the point at the very beginning of this best of three that Pedro is just so good with the minor poison and these quick cycle decks that really limit his opponent's deck pool. And that's exactly what happened here. Really solid matchup. Not only is minor poison so much more consistent in damage than a hog EQ, but the Mighty Miner just overall a better champion, better for preserving the three card cycle. So Sosa right there, overall, he played a very solid game. No huge mistakes. I liked what he was doing with his aggression because at the end of the day, it's a lot easier to be aggressive with a 2.8 Elixir cycle deck. But 
Going in with the giant skeleton plus the guards at the bridge, I just thought that was a very aware play from Sosa, and it just gave himself a chance to win that game. So I liked game number one in terms of just all the micro and macro abilities from Sosa, but Pedro's matchup plus skill, it's just too much. As we head into game number two, 205 left on the clock, and neither player playing cards, but I was, I was really hoping that Sosa was gonna throw an emote back. Uh, only Pedro is throwing out emotes. Probably has him muted, um, but you know, Pedro starting off the bar, bro, the bridge, Bomber gonna come down to defend, and an E Giant in the back from Sosa. Fisherman up high here, so probably gonna be an E Giant versus RG. Usually I would say E Giant 100% has the matchup here. As we saw earlier though, in this specific matchup, Tombstone, Zappies, and the Fisherman for the RG. It's a lot, and it's going to be difficult for Sosa to break through three E-Giant counters. I recently... Uh, <laughs> I, I recently muted emotes in the game. I, I I had a day where I got BM'd three times in a row, <laughs> and I just couldn't take it. So I, I, I'm taking a break from getting emoted on... Just, just for a little bit. Just for a little bit. Just for a little bit? I, my heart can't handle it. I, I got <laughs> I got very upset and I stopped playing for a couple hours after that. And I, I was having a lot of fun. I think I was playing the global tournament or something and I, it just it ruined my mood for a bit. So yeah, there. I don't have the heart of some of these players. All right, well, Lightning gonna drop down here, not hitting the tower, just as some solid defense. Pedro doing a good job of stacking up a lot of units though. And the Inferno Dragon and get completely taken out by the Zappies here. Here comes the Skelly Queen ability plus RG. I don't know how Sosa defends this. Yeah, Pedro looks pretty excited right here. No Zappies, so the Inferno Dragon, no, oh he's going to go in with a Fireball, and I love that. You, you kind of just want to keep the pace going. You, you still have one of the Hogs, two of the Hogs, and the Fisherman on top of the tower, and the Mother Witch forgets about the Fisherman. 12 seconds left in the game. We see him waste the Lightning. Good game. Pedro with another clean set, and that's going to be game over. Pedro, a perfect set. It's too easy for him. I mean, pretty solid matchup, especially with the Inferno Drag version. Inferno Drag almost getting no value. Something we didn't really talk about there, though, the Mother Witch. The Mother Witch got so much value. I don't know how many pigs she spawned in there, but the piggy's constantly distracting, chipping away, and it's all smiles for Pedro. He knows that he's going to be continuing on in this winner's bracket to, have, to be one step closer to securing that golden ticket. That's right. One win away, and... I, I want to tell, tell the people in the replay booth just to, to catch the end of that game in game number two because one of the Zappies survived and yeah. he couldn't play the Inferno Dragon up top and we just saw everything overwhelm and it was because of that one singular Zappy that would have reset the Inferno Dragon over and over and over again. And that's just the difference. You you miss one spell. We've seen it a thousand times in Clash Royale. You miss one spell. You you miss just one troop, and that's it. You you can't come back from that. So in game number one, it it, it was just solid defense from both players. But one of the players had a better matchup, and he's just too talented with the deck overall. Very simple for Pedro. And there it is, the little Zappy that could sneaking behind the RG, and just. Phenomenal from Pedro. And look how much fisherman value happened here as well. Pulling in the gold knight, pulling in the goblin brawler, pulling in the bomber as well. And a drag just sitting there trying his best to work out these piggies, <laughs> but it's almost useless in a matchup like this versus all the different swarm cards. It's interesting to see Sosa use the Inferno Dragon in this match when Pedro didn't use the uh, Electro Wiz or the Zappies previously in this best of three. And uh, I think that's kind of the difference maker. Maybe if he could have used a Phoenix or even a Baby Dragon, this matchup could have gone a much different way. Yeah, that's a really good point. I totally agree with that analysis. I don't think you can afford to use an Inferno Dragon variation, especially one with Lightning, when all of those cards are available yeah. to Pedro. I, I, I think... I think that's certainly the biggest mistake he's made this weekend. He still has more opportunities to win. He's going to fall to the lower bracket, but his day, well, I mean, I guess his day is over, but his his weekend is not over. He will be back tomorrow. Game number one, our, uh, Hog Giant Skeleton going against Minor Wallbreakers. Minor Wallbreakers chip throughout the game. Too much for Sosa. 
Game number two, I, I uh, we we practiced this before everything. I was supposed to wave and I didn't wave, so that's on me. Game game number two, it's just Lightning Inferno Dragon going against Zappies. You, you, you can't stop it. Yeah, I mean, Lightning, I mean, I didn't even think about it, but you're absolutely right. The Lightning's not getting any value here as well. Like the only thing that Lightning, get, like there's nothing. I mean, the Mother Witch, maybe, <laughs> may, maybe a Fisherman, but Tombstone, Zappies, Skelly King, even Fish Boy, there's just like no Lightning value. The Gold Knight NATO is your only chance to deal with all these swarms. And Sosa just didn't do a great job of capitalizing on that. The Golden Knight just died to the Fisherman. You need to use your Goblin Cage in a situation like that to pull the Fisherman in so that the Gold Knight NATO dash can get enough value to clean up the Zappies and the Mother Witch. And he just didn't make that happen. Well, and talking about making things happen, guys, last month it was Mike. Pedro. Oh, I'm not mic'd to you two guys. That's a little... Little routing problem here. Got it all sorted out. Last month, folks, it was Pedro losing to two of our top three finishers, losing to Pandora, losing to Kickash, aka Clown. And then this month, very different story. He finds himself that he's guaranteed a top three finish with the wins over Hugo and Sosa early on. And of course, tomorrow we'll see him face Mohamed Light. But that's a big turnaround here for Pedro. And uh, Josh and Juicy, one more thought on this one is that Pedro was already coming into the weekend as number one on the points leaderboard outside yeah. of Mo and Pandora. And now, of course, he's going to extend that lead significantly. On, as we wrap up our day one here, Juicy, I'll start with you. Is Pedro the biggest winner of the day? You know, absolutely. Like you said, he's number one in the point leaderboard. If you guys don't know, you can qualify for the world finals with a golden ticket. But the other way is through the point system being consistent every month. And that's what he's done so far. After winning two matches, he's going to extend that lead. And even if he doesn't win this um, monthly finals and get the golden ticket he still gives himself huge chances to make it to the world finals josh of course we have a, the big matchup pedro and muhammad light tomorrow but uh, i'm going to set you up for some final thoughts on the day is moogie the guy who's going to make the biggest run out of those four in the lower bracket i'd love to believe so but in my heart of hearts i don't know i i don't think that he's going to be the one that does it. I, I think there's a real chance that it's going to be one of these other players. Um, and, you know, Mugi did a lot of great things, but he also did a lot of things that I'm not used to seeing from him. So I'd love to see him just kind of collect his thoughts and figure out his game plan for game number two or for day number two. But this wasn't his best showcase yet. And he's still in. So that, that's the greatest thing about Mugi. He, he's still in. And, uh, you know, it feels like we haven't seen him at his peak yet. Well, we'll see if that peak does happen tomorrow in the same place on this channel, 1400 UTC. Find out where that is, what time that is, wherever you are from. But we're back here again. If you haven't yet, turn on notifications, ring that bell so you're alerted. You know when you can come back here for Clash Royale League tomorrow and throughout the year. And, of course, follow us at Esports Royale EN on Twitter to follow along all the action there. For everybody here at Clash Royale League, Juicy J, AC, I'm Rich Slate, and we'll see you back here tomorrow to find out who wins that big golden ticket. get on tower here lightning in golden knight is there a dash there is no dash available is there time for one more lightning or nato there is not mohammed light gets it done can he get it off switch oh just dies in the air you see the look of disappointment there may be can the hawk get it in time no what a thin margin we see special games from him every single day and Whoa. there's a low oh my wow. word that was so close <laughs> pedro with another clean set and that's gonna be game over pedro a perfect set